Let's do this. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to our third annual conference. We received over 600 registrations this year, which we take as a sign of your growing interest in the, in the topic. This year's event is two days long, packed with different formats. We have two keynotes, demos by companies and agencies, discussions involving top academics and practitioners. In, in sort, we cover all of what computational antitrust can be. Now, before I dive into today's agenda, I'd like to give the floor to Roland Vogel, the uh, Codex Executive Director, whose support for the Computational Antitrust Project cannot be put in words. Roland, the floor is yours. Thibault, thank you so much. I'll be very brief. Um, I, uh, yeah, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is our third uh, annual computational antitrust uh, conference. Uh, Codex is a center here at, uh, at Stanford, a joint center between the Stanford Law School and the Stanford Computer Science Department. Our mission is to bring information technology to the legal system and make the legal system more efficient for all stakeholders. We're particularly focused on computational law the branch of legal informatics that concerns itself uh, with the automation of legal analysis. And uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is an area in computational law that's, uh, that's growing rapidly. And um, uh, much of it is uh, thanks also to, uh, to uh, uh, Professor Schreppel and his team uh, really driving discourse around computational antitrust. And so we're grateful for all the great work that uh, Thibault and his team are doing. Um, he's, uh, he's really done tremendous work and I think it takes both vision and grit to make uh, things happen. And so really appreciate all the great work you're doing. And yeah, I'm wishing you all a, a wonderful conference today. Well, thank you so much. I guess the first surprise of this year conference is your French accent. This is quite perfect. And I would not expect that you will pronounce Schreppel the exact French way, such as you should be. So <laughs> help, being married to a French woman helps. So, but thank you. Yeah, that helps <laughs> indeed. <laughs> All right, well, Roland, again, once again, as you know, and as everybody knows, if you've been here for the last two years, the, the project wouldn't exist without you. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Um, okay, I take just a couple of minutes before I introduce Teodora Grossa, who's uh, more than central in uh, running the project. Um, as we discussed already, the Computational Antitrust Project is indeed three years old. Um, this year, we published six academic papers, organized a conference at the OECD. We released podcast episodes. We were quoted by the G7, the OECD, competition agencies, and we published an annual report in open access with contributions from 26 competition agencies. Now, a lot has changed since we introduced the project back in 2020. Generative AI is obviously everywhere. That is a computational tool which is driving the point home for us, these tools can help and they, comes with, they come with challenges that deserve an academic take. Number two, agencies are showing teeth. They are building expertise and hiring computer and data scientists. We see that trend all over the world, which is quite telling. Three, there is a growing interest in related questions. I believe that the momentum is on our side. We see conferences being organized, research being published in different journals on the topic, and we see agencies engaging more and more with us. Now, looking ahead, my prediction is that in five years from now, every single agency in the entire world will be relying on computational antitrust. Now, of course, they will do so with different tools and with different levels of expertise, but now that some regions, including the EU, have adopted ex ante rules, the debate is moving towards the efficiency of those rules. And the obvious answer is computational antitrust. Computational tools are becoming indeed an absolute necessity, although it is probably not sufficient when it comes to understanding policies, detecting practices, analyzing those practices, enforcing remedies, monitoring the effects of antitrust, and assisting companies with compliance. When it comes to law firms, 
it will take longer, but we see that they are also moving in the direction of computational antitrust by relying on companies like the ones that we have invented to present tomorrow. So if computational antitrust is here to stay, let us make the best out of it. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. This is not the only time you will hear me saying that to receive our papers and videos. And now I would like to thank Teodora Grossa, our editor-in-chief, so very much for all the work that she's doing with us. Teodora, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Thibault. It's a great pleasure to work with you. And uh, I just want to say that I joined the team in 2021. And back then, the project seemed to be very much experimental. The atmosphere was more of trying to figure out what we can do and what's feasible. But as you just said, it's clear that we are here to stay and that we've achieved so much in the past three years. And this is visible not just in the big milestones, but also in small gestures like getting a message on LinkedIn for a student who wants to write on the topic or get on board. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to cooperate with us, we are more than open to find ways to get you on board. Make sure to get in touch. And uh, now, just because you focused on the future, I want to take a step back and see what we've done so far and what makes our project unique and what its key strengths are. So I think that in the first place, what makes us special is that everything we do is open access. And this shows a commitment to the fact that we believe that knowledge should be shared and know-how as well. And given the fact that computational tools are by their very nature replicable once they are developed and also easy to adjust to different circumstances, what we try to do here is also try to create a learning community where agencies that are less um, developed and which are understaffed or underfinanced or both can get to learn from those at the forefront of experimentation. And then something else that's happening nowadays and that's something Thibault has mentioned is that we see a lot of instruments being passed almost on a daily basis, which have a huge impact on competition and market structures. And by their very nature, regulatory tools are a step back in the sense that they are a move away from nuance and individual assessment to broad-based rules, which have presumptions. And I think that computational tools offer us an alternative of doing things differently and trying to inject more nuance into the assessment. And this is very much important, especially in the case of new technologies and new business models, where we cannot possibly know what the effects long-term are. And we should be more cautious in terms of coming up with ex-ante regulation and trying to experiment more with case-by-case -case analysis. And um, on that note, I'd like to wish you all a great two days of computational antitrust. I hope you learn a lot from us and that we learn a lot from you. I encourage everyone to participate in the Q&A as much as possible. And uh, I'll give it back to Thibaut now. Thanks so much for tuning in. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Odora. Um, as we were discussing just before launching the webinar, if you were with us the last two years, we achieved something which I will say is quite exceptional, which is to finish all the panels on time. And we have the exact same ambition for this year. Uh, so without further ado, I will welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Susan Athey. Um, I've seen you in the chat, so I'm now uh, confident that you are with us. It will take probably just a few seconds for you to be promoted as a panelist. In the meantime, I will take this opportunity to uh, introduce you. Um, your biography uh, could take us probably the 40, 30 minutes that we have with uh, that you have with us. Um, what I would do instead is that I will uh, take this opportunity to um, do sort of a computational antitrust biography. Very nice to see you. Um, so Susan, for everyone out there, is the chief economist at the DOJ Antitrust Division which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, she is also the economics of technology professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where she is currently on leave. Now, what is maybe more specific to computational antitrust is that Susan has published dozens of articles, including one, Estimation and Inference of Heterogeneous Treatments Effects Using Random Forest, two, when should you adjust standard errors for clustering? And three, the impact of machine learning on economics. So in other words, Susan is working at the frontier between economics and computer science, 
which is the main reason why we couldn't hope for a better keynote speaker. Susan, thank you so very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Hi, um, can you hear me well? Perfectly well. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And I would like to say it's back to great to be back home at Stanford, but I guess it's great to be back on a Stanford Zoom. <laughs> it's about as good as we can get. Uh, and I'm, it's really wonderful that you've put this event together, um, especially being in government and realizing how scarce resources are and how difficult it is to just you know, find people to gather information and help us keep on top of trends. Um, the work that you're doing and the, the research you're pushing forward is, is incredibly valuable. Um, I'm now 18 months into my time as chief economist at the antitrust division. So it's actually a really great time to take stock of where we are in the US and in the antitrust division and where we're going. So to start with the foundations of expanding the use of computational tools and antitrust include people, computing infrastructure, software, data. Um, and although there are ways to hack our way to make faster progress, like using consultants and contractors and academic visitors and like me, um, but others too, uh, we, to make things really sustainable, um, we do need to have some of those capabilities embedded inside the regulatory authorities. It has a lot of advantages. Our investigations, policy issues move very quickly. I'm finding that, you know, I have to comment on something coming across my desk from, you know, policy initiatives to things other agencies are worried about or international enforcers are worried about, and we have to comment very quickly. Um, we, our investigations, especially merger investigations, are on very tight timelines, and so it's really helpful and frankly, a lot less expensive if we can do these things ourselves and understand them at the point that we're triaging. And one of the things that really surprised me and sort of I found a little bit concerning when I came into government was realizing just how much across all of the government we are outsourcing a lot of this work to contractors and consultants, um, which is efficient in some ways, but it's, um, it's expensive in other ways. And as this work becomes more central to what we do, um, again, having it in-house is super important. You know, last year you had our chief technologist, who I was very proud that we were able to bring in, um, Laura Edelson, who's a computer scientist, who was a visiting academic. Um, this year we're hosting Lin Wu, who's an operations scholar from UPenn. And in addition, we've been doing quite a bit to hire and build up our technology and data science expertise in-house. But given how hard it is and sometimes painfully slow to improve, um, prioritization is really important. And so therefore it's important as I've been thinking about building things out to understand the capabilities we already have and what we do so that we can maximize the impact of our investments. Um, so I'll start out by maybe giving a little bit of history and context for what we do actually in the US in some ways, we are very far ahead of a lot of our other counterparts um, in having extremely large and high quality teams that we've built up over decades of people that, that do a lot of data work. Um, but we, we are also very much in need of expanding and modernizing our capabilities to meet the, the latest challenges. So, um, and then I'll turn to talk at the end about some advances and opportunities in implying a computational antitrust um, outside of, of data. But just to start with, um, you know, if you, you know, when you talk about computer science or machine learning or computational social science or computational anything, it's important to, if we're talking about the data part of it, it's important to step back and realize that a lot of these, these areas and disciplines have been working with data and really developing very tailored and specialized methods that are highly optimized and sort of, you know, you're all, they're always at the frontier for the specific problems that they've been working on. So we just celebrated 50 years of the um, now called, it's called EAG, now titled Expert Analysis Group at the Antitrust Division, which was had been probably for the longest period, the economic analysis group. And it's been retitled expert analysis group to reflect that we are bringing in a lot of other adjacent um, fields, everything from behavioral um, to technology. But um, 
all this, all these years, um, we've been doing what has now been, you know, rebranded and sort of sub-specialized, if you like, into data engineering, um, you know, data description and data analytics using a whole variety of, of statistical techniques. Um, right now, when I when I joined, we had about 50 PhD economists and eight statisticians. That's in the antitrust division. And at the FTC, there's also a very large group. And actually, they've also been expanding, for example, putting together a technology team that, that, that's distinct. Um, and But then since I joined, we've created new teams, a data science team, a technology policy team, and we've been actively hiring into that with, with several new people joining over the last few months that really expand our capabilities in new directions. For example, our, our new data scientists were chosen um, to complement the large and, and deep expertise we already had with data um, for their specific expertise in things like algorithms or modern tools for analyzing larger data sets, machine learning, and so on. So you know, what do we do and how does that help prioritize our needs? Well, one of the biggest things, most common things we do is we investigate mergers. There are thousands of mergers that are reported to us every year. Um, you know, Dozens are, are go to a more advanced stage of investigation um, where after an initial review that determines there may be competition concerns. And in those more, more in-depth investigations, again, only a subset of the thousands, um, we will request data through things like civil investigative demands, whereby the merging firms and sometimes other firms in the industry respond to our request for their data. Now we have to do this on a very tight timeline and the firms aren't always happy to be, um, to be doing this, although they're, they're generally cooperative. Um, and so it's really important to know what you're looking for and, um, and anticipate and make those requests properly because often you only get one bite at the apple under the very tight timelines we're under because firms are merging and you know it, it, it needs to move. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that some of the things we need to, to do is first just think about what questions might we want to ask, and I'll come back in a few minutes to some examples of those. Anticipating those questions, we need to, we need to think well, what, what data might they have, what data might the firms have that would help us answer the questions. And of course, there's, a, there's often some close relationship to the questions we need to ask and the questions the firms need to ask. The firms are trying to decide what price to set, and we need to understand about their incentives to set prices and how a merger might impact those incentives. So if you understand how firms think about things and use data to do things like set prices or, or choose quality or decide you know, where to enter and so on, um, and how they, how they gather data about their customer preferences, if you understand what the firms are doing themselves, you can better anticipate what questions to ask the firms and look for. Um, it also, it's very helpful to understand what kinds of data they might be creating in the regular course of business. If you understand how you operate a website and what needs to be logged when you operate a website and, and that understand that some data is needed by certain operational teams and other data is used and aggregated by the companies to do analytics, then you can start anticipating where you might find the data, you know, how it's collected, how it's stored, and so on. And so getting people who have some experience with that, who really understand you know, what data must be created is helpful. From Just personally, from all of my years of experience, if I look at, look at a website or I look at a service a company's providing, I'm like, okay, they've got to have this, this, and this, and this, or else you know, these results couldn't possibly appear on the screen. So you, you're able to reverse engineer with a little bit of experience, just intuitively what, what's going on, and that, that can be really helpful. You can anticipate. Will they be? Are, should, will they be doing A/B testing? And you know what kinds of data might be created from A/B testing and randomized experiments that they might be conducting. That you and if you understand a little bit how algorithms work and how they might be implemented, you can also um, anticipate and make decisions about what to ask for. Now, once you've kind of figured out at a high level what to do, there's also a lot of data engineering. I mean, this, this data might be distributed. Firms themselves have a hard time, you know, joining data sets from multiple sources. And a lot of times firms haven't, haven't gotten along the journey to having their own data as useful as it could be for them. And that's actually been a big thing for the last 10 years is firms are just trying to figure out themselves how to use their data. And now here we are coming from the outside and we've got to understand it and get it right um, in a very short amount of time. 
So there's, there's the data engineering, figuring out how to join the data in a reliable way and make sure it's correct. Um, and, and that requires knowledge of data engineering. Um, once, once you have the data and get it on board, of course, you have to have a place to store it. And if it's large, then you, know, the, you, you may not be able to use the traditional tools that we use in the past. So you know, historically, we, we used often you know, desktop software, you know, packaged statistical software that in order to analyze data sets that often would store everything in memory um, and was not, you know, was not optimized for these larger data sets. And so even if the conceptually we're doing a lot of the same tasks that we did before, just implementing them is different with um, with larger data sets. And so that's one of the things, capabilities we're, we're trying to get in. And of course, once you get the people in, if they can't use the software, um, we don't have the software, if the software is not approved, that can be another big challenge. Um, and so I think, you know, the government's getting better at this, but it, we still need to have more streamlined procedures when, when a lot of the software that's being used is open source or, um, you know, is, is not, a package that you buy once and install, and then you don't have to mess with it for another year. Um, we're so what? So what are we doing with all this data? Um, well, if we think about how we're going to then use the data in investigations or litigation, let me focus on mergers again because, and actually, let me even focus more on mergers between two firms selling similar products for simplicity. Just that's easiest to talk about, and that's mo our most common scenario. Um, then we would use data to do things like define relevant antitrust markets to figure out basically which products compete with each other the most strongly and to measure the intensity of competition between two firms and understand how that would their merger would spill over to competition in the in the industry as a whole so there's all sorts of tools and analytics we would use to answer those kinds of questions um, one type of example in that's not always possible, but in some industries it is, you can look at historically at entry and exit events. So especially like in industries where there's a lot of local competition, firms might enter a city, exit a city, or enter different geographies. Um, you might have also uh, just you know firms coming in and out. You might have historical price changes. And I'll come back to that. That's sometimes useful and sometimes not. It depends on why the price changed. Um, and so we can use that data to try to do um, causal inference. We want to understand what was the causal effect of a firm entering on competition and outcomes in a market. Um, now, anytime you are estimating causal effects, that is a hard science and it's been something uh, that's been the subject of really decades and decades of of careful advances in both statistical methodology and an implied practice that makes it reliable. Um, there are substantive assumptions required. That's because for causal inference, we want to know, you know, what we see what happened in the world, but we need to know what would have happened if the firm hadn't entered. The causal effect is the effect of entry or effect of exit. And of course, that's relevant for understanding what would happen in a merger, which is may remove a competitor from the market. So um, if you are, are doing that kind of work, you are estimating a counterfactual. So like, for example, you want to know what would have happened in that market if the firm hadn't entered or exited, and you need to take into account time trends and industry trends and other things that where things might have changed in that market, even if there hadn't been a merger. And counterfactuals are hard because at any, any particular observation, you see it either with the intervention or without the intervention, but you never see them both at the same time. That's the fundamental cause, problem of causal inference. It can be solved when you run, it's, it's easier to analyze causal inference if you have a randomized experiment, because then you have, you've randomized who has the intervention and who doesn't have the intervention, but things like entry and exit are rarely randomized. Although, in, you know, they can be now in, in the modern economy with with large scale experimentation, um, which is something I've worked on a lot of my research. But you know, in general, we don't have that luxury of randomized experiments. So then we have what we call natural experiments and we have this challenge of separating out correlation from causation. And that in turn requires adjusting for, um, for things that are, are changing in the background. So 
Um, another type of analysis is analyzing like how sensitive are customers to prices. And you can analyze that by looking at consumer choice data and seeing how consumers have responded to changes in price or quality in the past. So now if you if you, how do you how do you do this and why do we actually need anything new at all if we've been studying this for so long and we have such well established techniques? Well, first of all, there's Lot of, well, first of all, I mentioned before that if with larger data sets, it's actually often just not even possible to apply those techniques because the software packages that are available don't scale. That's something I've been working on in my lab at Stanford, like building scalable methods for studying consumer choice that use GPUs. Also, for bringing in ideas from the computer science literature, like embeddings, you know, foundation models and fine tuning. And you can use lots of data about shopping across lots of products and build a foundation model with embeddings for products and then use those in a specific, more focused analysis of a few products. Um, you can study heterogeneous treatment effects when you have lots of granular data and you can see who's responsive to price and who's not. So those have been things I've done a ton of in my academic work. And it's starting to really take hold in applied social sciences and applied economics across the board. It's becoming very, very popular. But it's, there's still a, a long time to translate from the methods to the applied academic literature to actually you know, investigations and litigation. And in litigation, people can tend to be pretty risk averse because you know, they know how to present a regression to a judge. They've explained it before. You know, it's established where there's, we just don't have a lot of examples of people explaining and presenting a machine learning model to a judge or a jury. Now, personally, I've been out there explaining all of these things to lots of different people, to business people, to you know, MBAs, to executives, and I don't think there's anything fundamentally harder about explaining machine learning than there is about explaining simple regressions. In fact, in some ways, it's easier because the machine learning part is often the predictive part. You're combining that predictive part with this causal inference part, and for predictive work, you can hold out a test set and kind of show how well your predictive model worked. So you can kind of shortcut the explanation of, how, of what the code does and just show, hey, look, in a test set, this works. And this is how well it works. This is the quality of the prediction. This is why this model and not some other model, because it predicts better. So it's much more objective in terms of showing which machine learning model you chose. So I don't think it's fundamentally harder, but we're just lacking that experience. And so that's gonna be one of the frontiers over the next five or 10 years is just getting that experience and getting people comfortable with using it. That's also gonna allow us to bring in things like text data and image data, which again is coming, it's, it's very big in the applied economics and political science, other social science literatures and marketing, it's, it's all over the place. But we're, we're still just on the frontier of really getting it in practice um, in these investigations and litigation. So those are some of the, the, the things that I think we, we, we need to work on. And we also maybe need to write more translational articles to, to give these examples of how do you explain it so that an attorney can help make the decision and get a sense of what it would look like to use the methods and practice. Um, let me just um, say a few other words about some other topics um, that are less data related. Um, that's I've spent most of my time talking about data, which of course is a big passion of mine, but there's other things that, that are also um, very much top of mind. One thing that I found increasingly concerning in recent years is how advances in di digitization have affected competition from a tacit collusion perspective or even explicit collusion. Um, you know, since at least the 1980s, there has been an academic literature um, seeing how algorithms can cooperate. In fact, like back in 1988, when I was an undergraduate, young undergraduate, one of the first things I used was like an, a genetic algorithm to see if that could, if, if these algorithms could learn to play Prisoner's Dilemmas games and, or like these pricing collusion games. And so even with 1980s computing and simple, very simple algorithms that were very ad hoc, you know, you could show how, um, how easy it was for algorithms playing games with each other to learn to engage in tacit collusion. And more recently, people have, have you know, advanced those ideas and, and replicated and, and elaborated about how that works with you would use neural networks or other types of AI reinforcement learning to learn to price. And so that used to be like a little more of an academic issue that only would be relevant in a small number of markets that were actually using algorithms. But now, you know, it's, it's just cutting across our whole economy. And, and so what, one thing that really concerns me is that as this becomes more common, we may see tacit collusion emerging with lower levels of concentration than we did in the past. 
you know, in the past, you might need a very small number of firms to be looking and reacting, while now it might be a larger number of firms if they're using algorithms and it's easy to observe prices and react very quickly. The, the economics say that, you know, that, that could lead to um, more collusion. And it's going to be very hard for us to fully address that through policy. So that's something that, you know, we really need some good ideas about how to deal with tacit collusion in that way. Um, we have some tools, but I, I, I fear that we may need more. And we may need to have stronger merger policy as a result. We need to make relook at the concentration levels that give us concern, if that's in industries where that's a concern. Um, a second thing is just um, you know, how do how these recent advances in AI can be balanced, how we can balance our critical policy objectives. Of course, there's so many dimensions of safety and fairness and bias and just mistakes um, that can come up in, in using these new AI models. And we're so far behind with the tools that we that we could have that would make it easy and cheap for a well-intentioned firm to check that their AI is meeting all of these societal objectives. And then the, the concern is that if it's if we don't have good tools and we don't have cheap and easy avail, available tools, then only the big firms will be able to comply with different types of regulations. It could hurt barriers to entry. And of course, regulars can be captured um, by large firms and write regulations in a way that unintentionally bias things in favor of big firms. So something that's been really exciting to be in the Biden administration, there's a whole government approach to competition. And here, we're, we're trying very hard to make sure that, that every time somebody is, is thinking about regulations, that we are actually remembering competition. And then a final trend I'll, that I'll, I'll close with is just this interdisciplinary approaches to the implementation, evaluation, and policy around technology. We've seen this in industry. We see this in academics. Um, and I, I'm seeing that in government, too. Um, at Stanford, you know, I was involved in cross-disciplinary efforts for AI research, founding an institute. In my lab, I had a mix of labor economists, behavioral economists, psychologists, and computer scientists, engineers, because all those people need to work together to build beneficial technology that meets societal objectives. Um, and so we're increasingly seeing those kinds of multidisciplinary approaches in investigations and in competition policy as well, whether it's behavioral economists or computer scientists testifying at trials. And, and so my, my hope in the future is that we will be able to, to keep up and, in fact, innovate in government and these interdisciplinary approaches to making sure that all of this amazing technology benefits society and is developed in a way that um, where we have the competition that we need to um, to make sure that the firms are responsive to what the customers and society wants. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, Susan, thank you so very much. You just provided us with a unique blend of practical and academic thought. So uh, thanks a lot. I see questions coming in in, in the Q&A. Uh, we have the luxury of having you with us for five more minutes. So let me try to make sense of those questions. And actually, I had prepared questions, but luckily you answered them all. Um, although there is one that indeed uh, came to my mind and I see that Alfonso has a, had a similar question when you said that it might be easier to explain machine learning uh, models than to explain advanced econometrics. The question, I guess, is whether this is indeed something that you considered at the DOJ, you know, when going to litigation, the, the willingness of a judge to take the evidence, regardless of the quality of the evidence, and the Alfonso question was uh, kind of related because indeed there is a black box issue, right? So this may be something that a judge may always return to you. So what would you, what is your take on that? I just want to be clear. I'm giving my own personal opinions about the future, about things that we haven't done yet in terms of, you know, explaining machine learning to a judge um, it, it, as part of like an ec economic analysis. Um, I have a lot of experience explaining it to other non-specialist audiences. And so that's really what I was basing my opinion on there. Um, so, you know, when I teach my classes about machine learning and causal inference at Stanford, um, I would often say that, you know, a linear regression is easy to interpret, but it's also easy to misinterpret. Hmm. Um, if, the, if the purpose of the regression is to try to adjust for other factors so that you get an all else equal comparison, so that you can compare a treated and control group. Well, here, like a treatment might be a market that had entry to a market that didn't have entry, something like that. Um, 
if you have a treated and control group, you might use a regression to adjust for other factors that you want to hold constant. But um, it's hard to explain why they should be in there linearly or quadratic or cubic or something else. And then the expert has to explain why they chose linear or quadratic or cubic. And then they have to present five different versions and explain why you get different answers and why the fact that you get different answers doesn't invalidate the whole exercise, mm. right? Yeah. But if you had a machine learning model that was selecting the model specification for that part of the model, and that's the way the academic methods um, work is that they kind of use machine learning for the predictive part, the part where you're adjusting for things, then actually there's well-defined tools for choosing. Which one do you pick? You pick the specification that um, meets certain criteria of, of goodness of fit. And so that's, I think it's easier to explain that than it is to explain omitted variable bias and explain polynomials and extrapolation and all sorts of other stuff. So I, I don't think that it's, it's easy to explain any of them, but every method has complications. And so we work really hard. You sit in a conference room for days and you try different explanations and you try to make sure you've got the most important factors and you're telling the truth and you're boiling it down. You know, I once explained that, you know, like the idea of a test set is like, you know, you're hiding the answer key in the, in the desk drawer for the teacher's office and then you send them students off and then you check, the, check, check and see if they got the answers right. And, you know, the audience got that. So I think those are the things that we just have to practice getting those analogies and explanations up so that you, and, and, and then but in some ways that makes the job of the expert easier. It's your, your, your job is hard when you have to like make all of these little choices. And the old fashioned econometrics way is that by hand, you made you know, dozens of choices, each of which could be a, a problem. So the more you can kind of have an algorithmic approach to the parts of the problem that really should be done by an algorithm, um, the easier your job is in a way. So that's, I, I can't get into all the details because that's really the sort, like the whole thing this literature I worked in for the last 10 years is about, is about how to combine predictive models and causal models in the right way. But I'll say that, you know, when, at the end of that whole research agenda, there's a decomposition into the predictive and the, and the causal parts, and you can often have objective criteria for showing why you do what you do. So the example you just gave in your explanation to the judge reminded me of what I did just last week using ChatGPT when I asked, explain quantum physics as if I was 10 years old, right? And usually it, it works quite well. Um, so let me ask maybe a final question, which also is uh, one that I had on top of my mind and that I see in the chat. Uh, you, So what is the, the DOJ policy when it comes to not relying on the tools that you would develop internally? but acquiring those to companies. And I see a question in the chat related to the data that you need for those tools to be efficient. Are you generating your own data sets or are you buying data, data set from you know, private companies? So what is your, your approach here? So in principle, it could be any number of things. Sometimes there's publicly available data. Sometimes you can buy data. Um, we have the civil investigative demands, so and we don't have a lot of money. So we often rely on data from the parties, and and sometimes you know publicly available data is just the aggregated version of the actual data. So generally, we go right to the source and get the actual data. But occasionally, it's also helpful to use other kinds of sort data sources, like you would use in academic research. Mm -hmm. um, so those are any any and all can can be used. Um, I wouldn't say that we're at DOJ. We're not in, in the antitrust division. We're not. Um, doing a lot of like designing new software packages, although our experts might, I mean, it's so hard to define these terms because in structural industrial organization, um, in some sense, every paper has a new algorithm of some sort in mm -hmm. computer science lingo, you know, a new estimator. I mean, you're, when you're estimating a structural model, the equations of that model are often tailored to the industry. And so the, the specific thing you're doing could be completely novel, say that our experts were doing. But usually we were, we'd be more commonly using off the shelf packages. And I think the challenges are just that, you know, if, if you're, if you need to scale up where you might need GPUs, then that's generally going to be something like Python. And if you're going to be doing Python, then you need to install these packages and so on. And that can be cumbersome and challenging. But I think even while I've been here, We've made quite a bit of advance in our ability to, um, you know, 
more nimbly get the tools we need for each um, particular case. But I, I'd say it's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's, we've gotten better. And I, I think all across the world, governments are gonna have to figure out how to maintain their safety and security, which is of course crucial, while being able to use tools that are, you know, not not produced the way they used to be. Yeah, and I'm reminded of the French competition agency it may not be the only one, but with a GitHub page, right? So it might also be that competition agencies will cooperate towards maintaining security of, of, of those tools. Um, on that, Susan, again, thank you so very much. Uh, indeed, last year I did not realize, but we had another keynote from a uh, uh, someone from the DOJ and having you this year is a real pleasure. Uh, so hope to see you in person. Um, and uh, yeah, on that, I'll move on to, to the next panel. Uh, thank you again. All right. So it's me again. Uh, I promise you that you won't hear much from me in uh, uh, after uh, the end of the hour in what remains for, for the last two days. Uh, but we will now uh, move on to our advisory board panel um and time for uh yes okay to to promote them as a panelist bill very good to see you i believe that rebecca is in the room as well yes good to see you as well um so i will introduce those two speakers in just a minute but first let me take seconds to explain the purpose of this panel so as i said in my introduction computational antitrust antitrust is becoming a necessity. It's hard to imagine a competition agency 10 years from now, or even five years from now, without any computational tools. So in the next 50 minutes, we will discuss how to embrace the future of antitrust. We will talk about how to merge antitrust and computational expertise. We will talk about education. We will talk about what competition agencies can do, whether it is in the coming weeks, or in the coming years. All right, now on to the panelists. First of all, uh, Mayetcher unfortunately cannot join us, uh, but luckily we have two stellar speakers with us today. Uh, we'll start with you, Rebecca. Uh, you are a professor of public and criminal law in association with the uh, Pembroke College at Oxford University. Uh, you are teaching a course amongst other uh, entitled Law and Computer Science, and you are publishing on related topic. Um, you also specialize in criminal law. So uh, very luckily, uh, you will bring a different and unique expertise to our, to our discussion. We are very grateful to have you with us and on our board. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we are also joined by Bill. Um, who is the Global Competition Professor of Law and Policy at George Washington University, where he is also the director of the Competition, uh, Competition Law Center. Bill, as you may know, served as the FTC, as NFTC commissioner from 2006 to 2008, and as the chairman of the FTC from 2008 to 2009. He is one of the world's leading experts in antitrust, in fact, I believe it is more likely that someone in the audience today has never drunk water than it is that you can find an antitrust lawyer who is not familiar with Bill's work. So again, to both of you, welcome. Now, we have decided for this panel and all of the other panels not to have long presentations, but to have back and forth between the speakers and the moderators, including for this one. I asked my two speakers to give me short answers, even though I realized that some of those questions will realize will probably require more than a couple hours to answer them properly, but that's unfair and that's the way I like it. So because the panel is entitled The Future of Computational Antitrust, the first set of questions will concern tomorrow's future. So we will discuss here actionable items and then we'll move on to a long distant future. So I'll start with you, Bill. Uh, first of all, very nice to see you as always. Great um, to be here, thank you. There is this quote um, from uh, George Orwell's famous book. I quote, who controls the past controls the future. And I believe the very same could be said for antitrust law. Who controls the past of antitrust controls the future of antitrust. This leads me 
to discuss something that I know you've been advocating for uh, for quite some time indeed, agencies looking at their past activities in order to better understand and better define their future policies. So starting at the level of each individual jurisdiction, how could they use computational tools to actually better document what they've done in the past? Uh, Kibo, thank you for the delightful opportunity to participate in the panel um, and congratulations on building a new institution so successfully. I, I think it's a, an axiom of experience with so many institutions in different areas of life that successful institutions progress through learning. Uh, they take account of past activity, they take account of past experiments, and they use experience, good and bad, to inform the way ahead. And that body of experience gives them an advantage in formulating new policies. I would suggest that in the area of antitrust enforcement, there's something that we could call big antitrust data. This is the assembly of all information about what agencies have done in the past by way of enforcement and activity. To learn, you have to know it's there. And I'm afraid there's an epidemic failure in our field to build good data sets within individual agencies and certainly across agencies about activity. Uh, to take one example, uh, a, a common lament about competition law is that uh, antitrust agencies for too long ignored innovation in uh, evaluating mergers or other practices. Uh, if this was true, that would be a damning uh, failure uh, of policy over time to ignore such a crucial factor in growth. Uh, fortunately, uh, in actually looking at what agencies have done, it's not true. Uh, there are a number of instances in which it was taken directly into account with supremacy over considerations about pricing, for example, or output levels. Uh, you only know that by being able to access earlier matters in which it was taken into account and to learn from the methodology that was used to account for dynamic considerations and innovation effects. Uh, today, if you want to do that, you have to build those data sets by hand. Uh, and for a researcher, that is a, a crippling disability. Uh, you can do it, but it's a brutal process. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were searchable databases within agencies that could allow you to summon this up, not just for the last couple of years, but let's say going back over decades? Uh, that would be a great advantage. It's, uh, it's terribly hard to do today. For agencies themselves, it would be so useful to be able to extract, say, from past cartel cases uh, to take the collusion concerns that Susan was raising, uh, antecedents to the current development of machine learning techniques for facilitating collusion. Wouldn't it be interesting to pick out of earlier cases instances in which we had some faint replicas of this problem arising earlier and seeing not only how agencies responded, but to appreciate the infinite adaptation of business enterprises uh, to the point that the collusion arms race is never over. And the infinite adaptability of firms suggests that one has to continue to develop programs. Uh, so uh, a, a, a useful frontier for better computational work is to improve the input that would go into the computations. And that is developing data sets, databases uh, that provide a meaningful view at one moment and across time of what agencies uh, have done. Yeah. And of course, you mentioned um, ignoring or pretending to ignore past cases, right? So for instance, cases in which innovation was taken into consideration, let's say 20 years ago, you may see this bias in research or policy, but this bias will not exist within competition agencies because of course, what they want is to better understand what they've done, right? And if they've indeed uh, addressed innovation 20 years ago, this is relevant information for them. So. The good thing here is that they have a very strong incentive to come up with the right data. Uh, and I'm reminded of um, a paper we published by the French competition agency, uh, Data Team, in which they actually created a network of all of their decisions, um, over 60, 100 decisions, put them in a network and made references um, and uh, actually displayed those decisions depending on how many times one decision was being cited by uh, all the decisions, right? And yeah. to the surprise of the agency, uh, and to my surprise, although I thought that I knew a little bit about French competition law, of course, some decisions we knew were cited a lot, but some other decisions 
we ignored, even, even the agency itself ignored that some of those decisions were cited a lot, which tells a lot once again, because it may mean that you are comfortable with going after this kind of practice on the market. It may mean that you may want to redirect your policy a little bit, or that indeed the practice is being implemented a lot on the market. So uh, I believe you wanted to react to that. Yeah, yeah Thibault, I, I think the technique that the authority used is exactly the right one. You want a comprehensive set of material that doesn't just present aggregates of activity. Uh, to tell me that you did 10 of those or five of those is useful to a point, but I want to know what's in your in your in your collection with links that tell me the subsequent history. That's the methodology to follow. And if you have this profile of activity, there are all sorts of things you can learn over time. Um, you can detect patterns of how to build cases. You start to notice that often a big bang case that represents a major extension of the state of the art stood on foundations of smaller cases which seen in isolation had minor economic stakes, might have been seen as unimportant. If you were hunting for big game, you'd never go after them. But if you saw them as the stepping stones to doing something bolder later on, you'd always have them in the portfolio as a way of building doctrine. So you see all kinds of fascinating patterns that enable you to predict something about how to build doctrine, how to extend frontiers, how to develop future cases, what kinds of ideas you can extract from past experience. The only way to do it is to know accurately what that past experience was. And the kind of data set that the Autorite put together, I would suggest would be a useful starting point for a global standard about how agencies should report activity. Yeah, and in that paper, by the way, available open access on our website, computationalantitrust.com, you can also access the graph on the Autorité de la Concurrence uh, website, uh, they actually provide the entire methodology they've been using and uh, strongly encourage all the competition agencies to build such a graph and why not to build such an international graph, right? Where you would see competition agencies quoting all the competition agencies, which brings me again to you, Bill, to the idea and the debate um, surrounding the idea of uh, making competition no more international, right? It seems to me that the debate is maybe less intense nowadays uh, than what it used to be, perhaps because of a big divide between the US and the EU created by the neo-Brandeisians. But in any case, it doesn't mean that this debate is not relevant. Um, and in fact, I believe that using computational tools, such as creating a network, but it could be also that you want to conduct all the type of studies, uh, you could actually make competition agencies in a position to better learn from each other. So what would you say here? What Which kind of data would you like to see, not when it comes to each individual jurisdiction, but again, looking at all competition agencies uh, from a network perspective? At a high level, a benefit of having 140 jurisdictions with competition systems, that's 110 more than we had in 1990, you know, barely 30 years ago is that it provides a enabling environment for a lot of experimentation where a good idea doesn't have to enter the system, the global system on a big scale. It can enter through one jurisdiction and the jurisdiction more than any other that set us on the path of the kind of developments that Susan was describing was the United Kingdom's Competition and Markets Authority. They made the investment in the data team. They put together a team of 50. Other jurisdictions have learned from that. I'd suggest without a rigorous proof that that's been the catalyst for moving other jurisdictions to going beyond having the chief technologist isolated in an office, but to build a real integrated capability. Um, the, the network that could tie together agencies enables them to learn from what others are doing. This is learning not only from your own experience, but learning from others, accelerating the process of learning and taking into account the developments, good and bad, that have occurred with the experiments. So, so a networked approach to policymaking in this arena allows experimentation to take place, but crucially, uh, it ties together jurisdictions by allowing them to see what's working, what's not working, uh, learning, coordinating approaches. Jurisdictions that might not have the capacity on their own to build a robust system using a regional approach might be able to replicate some of the same capabilities and techniques. 
um, this uh, enables you again to progress in the direction of experimentation and learning that advances the adoption of practices and enables their adjust adjustment over time. Uh, and we've seen that happening, better coordination, networking, cooperation, all of those things can accelerate the process of adopting uh, practices that are working. And very importantly, pointing out dead ends that haven't been successful. All right, so now on that basis, I am absolutely delighted, Rebecca, to welcome you on this panel, precisely because you are not an antitrust expert and we can actually merge your expertise with Bill's expertise. Some of the papers that we published by non-antitrust experts were actually the most groundbreaking, I believe. And you have great expertise when it comes to uh, computational law, generally speaking, but more precisely when it comes to algorithmic decision-making. So let us assume that competition agencies, but we can even talk about all agencies, have indeed a better view of what they've done in the past, thanks to Bill's suggestion, right? This means that competition agencies may realize, okay, I've done too many tying cases. I now want to do a new type of case. So I will go out there, meaning on the market. I will start doing my best to detect practices. And then let's say that, oh, finally, I may have a case. So I may have a practice that I need to investigate. Now, you've been working on the oversight of algorithmic decision-making and the potential use of judicial review tools. And those tools are often designed to optimize decision-making. But the questions, of course, becomes optimized to what end? So can you please tell us more about the main benefits and the pitfalls, I believe, that competition agencies or all agencies, in fact, should consider when relying on algorithmic decision making? Yeah, thank you so much for the question and, and also for the invitation. It, it's a great treat to be here. And as you say, not exactly my, my sort of sphere of expertise and, and to hear from your other speakers. And I think um, one of the things that we have to think about, which is very much a point which was raised um, by your previous speaker, Professor Rathi, is um, the use, the metric that we use to assess our choice of system. She was talking about choosing a particular kind of system for a particular context. And one of the things that we need to think about as we make those choices is which metric we're using to assess the performance of a particular system to decide whether it's a, a system we want to adopt. The most sort of straightforward one of those that we can think about is sort of a you know false positive, false negative rate, things like that. But we know that there are, of course, huge numbers of other metrics that we might use, specificity um, and recall sensitivity and so on. And that's before we get into specific metrics, which look at, for example, disparity across subgroups. So even looking at the performance of the system as a whole, there are a large number of different metrics that we might choose. And the problem is that no system is going to perform well against every single one of those metrics. So it is going to be a policy choice as to which of the metrics you want it to perform well against and which ones you can live with it performing badly against. And we really do need that kind of theory of metric choice, and we need the law to develop that theory. It's not completely alien to the law. There are existing examples of sort of embryonic forms of it in the law that we could build up, but it is going to have to be built up and it is going to have to become much more sophisticated. So you mentioned that I am familiar with the criminal context, and there's a great example there, the, the famous example of the Compass risk prediction system. And the, that was effectively a battle of the metrics between North Point and ProPublica, because ProPublica point out that it has a much higher false positive rate for black defendants, much higher false negative rate for white ones. North Point doesn't come along and go, oh, yes, you got is What they say is yes, but it achieves predictive parity. So against our metric, which is the one we think is important, our system is functioning just fine. Thank you. And you need the law to have a system for saying yes, but in this context, that is not the metric you should be looking at. Or there is a reason why you should be looking at the, the ProPublica metric, at least as well as the metric that you have chosen. And that's what we need the law to sort of build up and do. And say, even in a context where you're not talking about disparity across subgroups, then you still need to, to think about your, your theory of metric choice. And I think um, that one of the legal rules we can look to to really help us here is the doctrine of proportionality, which is one that we can borrow across from public law, because, as you said before, public law is a, an area of law designed to optimise and improve and make more fair and more accurate our decision making. So it kind of has an ideal set of tools that we can then borrow across into other areas of law when we're thinking about controlling decision making of a new kind in this algorithmic context. And there are sort of three bits to, to proportionality, as you'll know, and the, we can look at the first of all at the test of suitability to say, well, is the metric we've chosen suitable to achieve, achieve the aim that we are trying to achieve with our decision making system? So what is it we're trying to do? And is performance against this metric going to help us with that? So is our metric that we've chosen suitable for 
um, achieving the, the system, what it is that we want the system to achieve. So, for example, we wouldn't want to adopt a COVID test that had a really high negative rate because that's not going to do the job that we want a COVID test to do, for example. We can also look at the fair balance part of proportionality to weigh the ways in which the system performs well against the ways in which it performs badly. So this would be the answer to our, our North Point compass problem is we would say, well, yes, you are getting some gains in terms of prediction, but you're also having some disadvantages in terms of the, the increase in disparity. And so we think overall those disadvantages outweigh on a fair balance basis the advantages that you might be getting. And finally, we can look at the necessity part of proportionality, which, of course, asks us to check whether we're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut when a nutcracker would do instead. And one of the good examples of this um, comes from a paper by Rodolfo et al. And they point out that you can sometimes have a ground truth matched system. So if you're using a predictive system, you can sometimes have a system where you actually test it against ground truth before you operationalize whatever it is that the system is predicting. So their example was people who were flagged for some kind of social service intervention, but that intervention would only actually happen if they did indeed end back up in the in the criminal justice system again. So that the, sort of, uh, there's a flag put next to their name, but only when they're back in the system is that flag triggered and then the intervention is triggered. So if it's possible to waste until you have a ground truth matched system, then that's obviously a, a better way of dealing with it than just sort of prediction on its own. And that also allows you to do the, some of the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of learning from what's happened so far. You can then also feed that back into the system. So I think those sorts of tools are the kind of thing that we already have in the law, but we can then use those tools to develop a, a framework for helping us with things like metric choice. And of course, metric choice is only one example of, of one of the sorts of challenges that we're going to have to face in this context. So um, I don't, I'm not sure if you have seen this paper or it's an article that the MIT Tech Review published quite a few years ago where it's about compass and you can actually uh, do it yourself, right? So you could say, well, this is where I think we should put, you know, on the scale from letting people in jail or taking no chance of that. Um, and then I'm using that in the classroom and, and very quickly you realize then there is no perfect efficiency, right? Which would mean to let all the bad people in jail and all the good one free. Um, and so you have to make, to come up with kind of moral decisions um, and so you provided us with a framework for which, you know, from the point of view, we, we can actually uh, approach the subject. I guess maybe a follow-up question would be, uh, are you aware of um, any government or agency making those three variables uh, transparent? So telling the public, well, this is the choice we've made in terms of, you know, efficiency, accuracy, and so on and so forth. So it's a really, really good question. So um, I likewise talk to my students about it. And of course, I'm at Pembroke in Oxford, and we're very proud of the fact that Blackstone has a long association with, with Pembroke College and, and also we know with the US. And of course, that that's exactly it. He's famous for having said, well, you know, better 10 guilty men go free than one innocent person goes to prison. We have a more recent case in the UK in the context of terrorism where the judge says, well, hang on a minute, you know, let, let's actually have a think about these numbers. I'm not going to go for that if it's, you know, 100 guilty mm. people going free. So where, where exactly are we going to draw the line? And that's exactly what I say to the students is well look you know what they're they're not computer scientists they're talking in in those terms but if they were they'd be talking about how high a false positive versus false negative rate are they each comfortable with and if they were using computer science terminology that that's the conversation that the the two jurists would would be having across the centuries so the, yes i think we do we really do have those tools in terms of are we am i aware of them being made public no one of the things that i have um written about and and thought about a lot is that i would like there to be more algorithmic transparency on the part of governments in terms of the choices that they're making even frankly in terms of um revealing the systems that they are using the context they're using them in what they're using them for and as your previous speaker was saying which of the models they've chosen for those contexts particularly and also what metrics have they then used to test them um we do have a thing called the algorithmic transparency reporting standard in the uk um which was uh, which is something that was that's developed um, by in combination between government and, and other agencies but it's not compulsory to use it so there are some examples on the website if you go to it and it is a great tool but there's no compulsory incentive to require um, agencies or, or government entities to register their algorithms on that that system so i think that would be a, i think that would be a great first step actually it would be, be compulsory transparency and also transparency around some of these model choice metric choice decisions yeah and of course one of the um particularities of the doj is that that institution has to bring cases before the court right and then explain why this model 
I know that it was considered at some point that the same will be implemented for the European Commission, but this is not how it works. The European Commission can actually investigate and then sanction the, the companies themselves. Although, of course, those companies could always appeal, go before the general court, and there you may want to see, uh, or you may have transparency, right? Or actually the making public of uh, what they've been doing. Now, you've mentioned criminal law quite a few times, and actually, I think what's interesting and maybe at the intersection between here antitrust and criminal law is that some antitrust practices especially in the united states but also in the eu not at the eu level but at the member state level can be called criminal right now last week actually just last friday the european parliament european council and the european commission just voted the ai act uh we don't have the final draft but from the previous draft, what we've seen is that it will contain provisions that will have a major impact on the use of computational tools to detect criminal activities. In a nutshell, the AI Act tells agencies that if they use these tools to detect and analyze potentially criminal practices, then these tools are to be considered high risk, which comes with many legal requirements. So to put it in another way, the AI Act may create a disincentive to use computational tools to detect a practice that a member state is saying is calling criminal, such as a cartel in certain member states. Although if they are called criminal, those antitrust practices are the most harmful, at least on paper, right? This is the reason why they are called criminal. So my question to both of you is, what is your take on these provisions, which from what I understood, was taken really to, you know, for hardcore criminal law, but may have reminiscence in a sense when it comes to antitrust. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I think I think you've um, hit the nail on the head, actually, with your your last um, point, which is that there is, that's exactly right, that, that criminal law spans a, a wide spectrum of behaviour and, and provisions which may have been intended for the sort of more blue collar end of, of criminal law absolutely have that that implication, even in an antitrust context. And I think that's right. I also um, share your concern if the balance is struck in the wrong direction. So there is obviously a balance to be struck between the advantages of, of you know, increased efficiency, increased accuracy, actually increased increased fairness we don't always talk about with the system but but they can be less biased than humans in some contexts um, and more more um, consistent but obviously we know also from things like compass that there are there are potential downsides as well so it really is very much again about thinking of how we strike that balance how do we mitigate against the risks but how do we get the advantages Another point to make is, is the you know the inc possibility for increased efficiency and for criminal justice agencies generally, particularly actually in a non-antitrust context, there are real resource challenges at the moment. And this is a thing which, you know, computational tools absolutely have the capacity to help with, you know, decreased legal aid, massive overstretched court systems, particularly post-COVID. There is a huge capacity there for, for computational tools to help, which, and uh, this coupled with the, the point that Bill was making earlier, which I was nodding furiously at, the lack of available data sets to help with the building of tools in the first place. I think these are some real challenges which stand in the way of what could actually be very helpful uses of technology um, in this sort of context, provided that we can mitigate against those disadvantages. The other thing to say again is that not only, obviously, again, we haven't seen the, the sort of final text um, as of Friday, but in the previous draft, a lot of the terminology actually, even though the AI Act existed, a lot of the terminology is still very open textured. There were a lot of references to things like relevance or suitability or, you know, choice of the data from a relevant or similar context. Well, there's a lot of, and you know, choice of a, an appropriate metric. There's a lot of, of sort of work to be done by those words, um, which is sort of left really for the future. And that, again, I think is where we can bring some of our existing legal tools and our existing legal conversations about those things to help us to interpret those those provisions as and when we do get them in the final draft. Yeah, so two things, Bill, before I go, to, I go to you. First, indeed, we have a political agreement on the AI Act, but this is just an agreement. Now you need to put that on paper and see if you agree regarding the way this will be drafted, right, which is a big one. Second of all, um, the AI Act applies to all the companies, regardless you are a US-based or Chinese-based company, as long as you do operate on the EU uh, market. It does not apply to a EU company that will be designing a tool to be put on the US market, but it means that then, uh, go to you, Bill, this AI Act is also relevant for the US companies, right? Because if they do something which may be seen as being criminal in EU competition law, then indeed, it seems that the agencies will have to comply with all of those requirements as opposed to 
investigating a practice which is not criminal in nature. So what is your take on this provision of the AI Act? Uh, it's, a, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, I think at some point we will have a political scientist, maybe it will be a PhD student, uh, have access to the deliberations that led to the formulation of the new legislative proposal. And one focus of that discussion might be, what kind of consultation did you do with other agencies, other uh, domains of law that might be affected by what you're doing? Because every time we have new legislation of this kind, and, and footnote, this is happening very fast. Uh, we obviously have a race across jurisdictions to see who will plant the flag of regulation in this field first. Uh, the Biden administration's executive order was, I think, clearly an effort to say we got outflanked on the DMA and the GDPR. It's not going to happen again for AI. Uh, so we're going to get our product out there on the market as fast as we can. So there's there's a rush to do this. And I understand the urgency from a policy uh, point of view, but there is an interjurisdictional rivalry uh, to be first as well. And, and if you use the, you know, the, 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 the biological metaphors that are popular now, think about ecosystems. Well, there is an ecosystem of complex other legal and regulatory commands that uh, blend into each other. They sometimes occupy adjacent uh, realms, but you can see the adoption of new law as putting a new species into that ecology. And a biologist would ask, well, what are the side effects going to be? How, how, how does that fit into the larger ecology? Um, maybe the European Parliament is thinking about that question. Maybe it isn't. Uh, or maybe that's an afterthought. And, and notice, notice what else is happening at the moment. Uh, that is the cascade of regulatory controls. It was the DMA. It's the DSA. It's foreign direct investment. It's foreign subsidy control. All of this has happened within a period of about five years. It's almost as though every six months there's another fundamental change. Uh, and on the U.S. side, there are, no, there are new controls on outbound uh, uh, investment that, that has a national security impact. Um, in the cascade of regulatory activity, how do individual legislators even have the opportunity or capacity to ask, how does this fit into the larger framework? Uh, I've seen a couple of political scientists just map out the complexity of the regulatory framework affecting tech over the past 20 or so years. And what you end up is a more and more cluttered graphic uh, that shows the, the, the expansion of controls, uh, their, their broad reach. Uh, I, I guess a question again that I have here, it's, 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 it's uh, the, the regulatory process lags behind commercial developments but the regulatory process now is extremely dynamic. It's multifaceted. And I don't have the sense that it's taking account of side effects and spillovers that, that might occur at the margin. It's almost as though we've got to build it, see how it works, and then we'll retrofit later on to address consequences that, that, that come up. I, I guess I'd feel a lot better if I had confidence that those kinds of considerations were being taken into account. And on the point of data collection and analysis, uh, it would be nice if there was a place you could look just to see what individual jurisdictions have in the regulatory pipeline, in the legislative pipeline, and as each item comes through the pipeline, to add that to the list so that as an analyst, you could say, this is what's happened the past 12 months, the past 24 months, the past 20, 36 months, uh, as a way and part of, the, of, of asking, what happens when you put the new species into the regulatory ecology? Uh, maybe it's benign, but I'm not sure the question is even being asked. Yeah, and if it's a complex network, indeed, it may be that one new species may actually create chaos in the entire ecosystem, right? So we'll see if the act is doing that for us. Uh, if so, this, mean, this will mean more conferences and more papers to be written on the subject anyway. All right. Thank goodness. At the long distant future now. Uh, I'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, so both of you are professors, which means that not only you do research, but you also teach. Um, and I know that you um, have thought a lot about how you approach your law students 
when the subject is indeed computational in nature. Uh, I can share my two cents on the subject when teaching about computational law and introducing the student to econometrics. I could see that some of them will complain, telling me, well, I didn't come to law school to learn about mathematics. Uh, when I do teach about the functioning of AI, basic skills when it comes to coding, I could see that they, they, there is like um, um, a strong interest and a desire to learn, uh, which pleased me to to and surprised me to the to the highest degree. So, what is your experience, and what do you and how do you approach again teaching computational law, computational things to to legal students? No, no, it's a great question, and it is very much something that we've we've had to grapple with um, during the course that we do in Oxford, and we do um, for both groups. So we, I teach the course is completely interdisciplinary. There is always a member of each faculty at the front of the classroom, and there's always equal numbers of students from the law and the computer science faculties in the classroom as students. Um, and we do do some sort of work with what, what my colleague calls on ramping at the beginning of the session. So we will explain the, the computer science concepts relatively basically for the for the law students to understand. And we'll explain the relevant legal concepts basically enough for the for the computer scientists to understand. We do a lot of sort of basic on ramping work at the beginning of the course, looking at things like metrics, confusion matrix, this kind of thing. Um, but what we generally find is that actually stripping back both the disciplines to their, their really sort of very simple component elements is actually of benefit to the students from that discipline, as well as to the students from the sort of other discipline, if you like. And we find that everybody says and when we've sort of surveyed students at the end of the course, they've all said that they understand their own discipline better for having had to look at it through the sort of beginner's eyes of a, of a completely different discipline. And I think sometimes having a, a more computational lens actually does help us to understand all better. Putting Blackstone's expression in terms of what he's really talking about is false positive and false negative rates. I think it does sort of give us a different lens to look at our own subjects. And sometimes it gives us a different set of tools to articulate the conversations that we were trying to have, but perhaps didn't have quite the right tools to articulate what it was we were trying to say before. And if you're looking in an area like like public law, I mean, for example, I operate in a system which has no written constitution. So we're always sort of thinking about the legitimacy of court intervention and, and court behavior in these contexts and actually having a sort of more computational, more mathematical approach to what it is we're doing when we use terms like fairness or bias or whatever it might be. That can actually legitimate, I think, sometimes certainly make clearer, but possibly also legitimate the operation of law. So I think there are huge benefits to lawyers from, from being able to see their, their discipline through this more kind of computational lens. And like you, I find that students are, are really keen to engage with that. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of this video um, in a conference, I think, at the University of Chicago when uh, Ronald Coase uh, said that it is actually easy for lawyers to learn about economics, but it is much harder for economists to learn about the law. Uh, I wonder to some degree if the same could be said when it comes to computer science. What What is your take maybe on that? What is your experience? Yeah. Because you said 50-50, so... Yeah, I suppose yeah, the computer scientists that will struggle, right? <laughs> absolutely. No, and I, I think um, I think so, sometimes we're a great disappointment to our, our computer science colleagues because, for example, I, I did a, a technical project which actually was about sort of gathering and, and storing data about decision making in a system and using provenance methods to, to kind of record all the decision points in the design and building of a system. And my computer science colleagues would sort of say to me, right, what are the things that the law would want to know? And I'm well, kind of everything really so what are the pieces of information that we need to capture all of it everything because you never know what might be what might be relevant or important and i think our, our the fact that we aren't always mathematical and the fact that we can't always pin our our rules down to an absolutely perfect algorithm for them i think sometimes is is a challenge to computer scientists so i think that's right i think they do understand why that is and i think you know they understand the sort of the need for flexibility and and, and deferring decisions that, that the law provides in those ways but i think sometimes that is i agree with you i think sometimes that is a challenge to my computer science colleagues we're not as logical as we like to think we are i think yeah and you know something you said earlier is that you have to ask yourself the question what it is that we want to do and actually in antitrust this one you know you you could take any antitrust expert and probably they will disagree on what the answer is right whether it is to protect consumers and how do you do it you protect the structure of the market innovation price non-price and so on and so forth so great questions and food for thought in any case now on to you bill in addition to teaching in a classroom uh, you are constantly traveling the world to teach uh, antitrust agencies uh, up until recently, you were a non-executive director of the CMA, the UK Competition Agency. So you have seen a lot about the implementation of computational tools and computational antitrust. So my question is, 
how should we approach teaching computational tools to not the students in the classroom, but to agencies? I, I, I love the approach that uh, Rebecca laid out. That is, I, I love having the two disciplines in the front and the podium and, and, and where possible, the interdisciplinary composition of the, the listening group too. Uh, I think that's absolutely brilliant and uh, a, a wonderful way of promoting the discussion. I, I, I find that uh, one of the best approaches, and I, I think this is something that Susan touched on, is to, to use a concrete case study or case that's a compelling example that shows how the principles can be worked. Start with something very basic and then try to extract broader observations from it. Uh, the, the concrete example is interesting. I think you pick an example with a product or service that everybody in the room is going to be familiar with, no matter where they are. Use that to, to develop the problem and to use that also to draw in specific activities or initiatives that other jurisdictions have been testing in the past. So pick a good concrete example, perhaps pick a case that they're familiar with, definitely pick a product or service that they know very well, have a multidisciplinary team at the podium uh, guiding the discussion, bring in, if possible, a representative from an agency that's been down the path before. Uh, and we'll talk honestly about the good and the bad and the indifferent that came up in the, in the course of the process. Uh, I think I think these are all 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 good ways to try and teach. And for for a suggestion about a starting point, public procurement would provide major examples for me. Everybody does it. It's such a core element of what government does, and it lends itself to a discussion of computational techniques so well. Yeah, indeed. Um, so. All right. So if you indeed come up with new ways, not only to educate people in the classroom and within the agencies, you will hopefully be prepare for a better future when it comes to computational antitrust. So now what I want to do is to ask you two final questions, uh, looking at a long distance future indeed. Um, I believe that the use of computational tools will change the substance of antitrust. Uh, we see already not looking at antitrust, but economic, economic theory that's um, if something cannot be quantified, it is more easily rejected, right? And and maybe for good reasons, part of the profession will actually think that this is a shame and this should be changed. But if you look at the top five economic journals, you see that indeed there is a model and uh, quantifiable uh, variables. I think to some extent, the same is happening when it comes to antitrust. Uh, Susan uh, provided quite a few examples about how and and the reasons why you may want to be able to compute evidence to be able to indeed convince a judge that you're right. So if we take that a step further, can we imagine a future in which small cases are automatically litigated? So for example, uh, can we imagine a future in which the company's machine learning systems will be in uh, direct talk with the agency's machine learning systems to do automatic checks and compliances, maybe to raise red flags, maybe to redirect a little bit the policy of the companies, uh, or is it something just for sci-fi? Uh, maybe Rebecca, I'll start with you. So I think I think it is possible um, to have full automation. Um, I mean, we already do in some contexts. So you know, eBay disputes, for example, we're all quite happy to to turn over to a relatively automated system in, in those sorts of contexts. So I think it's possible. Um, what we need to think about is whether we want full automation like that or whether what we're thinking about more is, is decision making assistance. So a system which will say, you know, in nine times out of 10, the, the decision you would expect in this context would be this. Do you want to accept that decision or do you want to change it? Yes or no. There are pros and cons of having a human involved. We shouldn't just assume that that that, that the, the human is going to somehow act as a fail safe. We might actually see that the human makes those decisions more inconsistent, that they bring their own biases to bear. And we would rather that they said yes to the, the, the ones suggested by the system than, than, than brought in their own ideas. So there are definite pros and cons to think about there. So I think we would want whatever system we adopted, whether it was sort of automated completely or whether it was just de decision making assistance, we'd want to monitor what was going on very closely and, and see whether it was in fact doing what we wanted it to do and whether there were any any sort of disadvantages for what was happening. More broadly, when we think about whether we want a human in the loop and, and sort of a, a question legally, generally, we tend to assume, I think at the moment, people tend to think that they want a human because they think they're going to be less error prone than a system. So I think the real challenges come 
when we move to a situation, if we move to a situation where actually systems are, are less error prone than humans and you can prove that you're getting a better outcome, because there's very often when you have these conversations, they say, oh, well, of course, we could never give X kind of a decision to a, an automated system. And you say, what well, really, even if it was going to outperform a human, even if you were going to get more consistent, more fair results, you still wouldn't hand it over. And so I think there is a bigger question there about are there circumstances where we still want to retain human decision making, even if actually that it, that becomes less good than automated decision making? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the really difficult question that we're going to have to answer. Yeah. And indeed, the time factor, I've seen empirical work where people will be willing indeed for, for the sake of time and saving time to get any decision right, uh, especially if the amount of the litigation is, of course, a small amount as opposed to, you know, litigating your home or your car. Bill, what is your take on the on the subject? I, I can imagine the introduction of these methodologies, for example, in the monitoring of remedies uh, taking place again in an experimental manner. Uh, I would an anticipate perhaps that authorities would begin with the, the smaller prototype. Uh, I think of uh, uh, doing these the suborbital and orbital flights before I'd go to other planets and extraterrestrial bodies. Uh, I do the testing there. I'd examine the results, I'd subject them to uh, a, a process of examination by peers and outside evaluators, but I can, I can imagine the path that one would take, and I, I take remedies as one example, that is a, a real-time monitoring of outcomes and mm -hmm. activities uh, where, where you test it. Uh, and, and, and I think on, 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 uh, to just on, on to Rebecca's point uh, about you know, what degree of human intervention, um, uh, I, I, I would imagine that this is a place where certainly the humans have to be involved on a continuing basis with the experiments, uh, asking a couple of things. One is, uh, uh, what were our prior assumptions about how this would work in the best of all worlds? Uh, mm. What would Nirvana look like? What are we actually seeing? What mm. kind of adaptation is taking place that we just didn't anticipate? Uh, adaptation by the business enterprises, adaptation by by the by the by the intelligent systems themselves. Uh, I mean, once we build the, the HAL 9000 computer and set it to work, uh, how is it actually going to interact with the human beings uh, who, are, who are in the space station? Uh, so uh, I think I, I, I would imagine a process of, of uh, absorption, of adaptation through experiments, through prototypes, uh, but, a, but a continuing effort on, on the part of the, the policymakers to, to observe and evaluate effects. All right. So, of course, I've asked the question in a way that sounds a little bit horrible, right? To be provocative or maybe a bit, a little bit of dystopians. But indeed, it might be that, you know, the counterfactual or what will happen without such a system is that instead of having nice behavioral remedies, you will have a structural remedy that would say, well, you have to break the company in three parts, right? So always have to consider what's real and uh, what's uh, happening without the use of those tools. All right. The very last question. We have one minute remaining. So I ask you to be very short, knowing that this is the question that will require the most time to answer. Uh, looking at uh, the field 10 years from now, can we imagine a future in which computer scientists are in leadership positions in law firms and agencies? Let's, let's even imagine, let's say, can we imagine an agency led by a computer scientist? Bill, I'll start with you. The place where it ought to happen or at least to be representative in the, represented in the leadership group is on multi-member boards. I would say any agency that has a multi-member board that says it wants to do work in this policy domain, is keen on tech, had better have somebody on the board. Now, now the past experience uh, with appointments in some agencies is not so good. In its glorious 108 year history, the Federal Trade Commission has had approximately 110 commissioners. Um, exactly four of them have been PhD economists. There have been three MBAs. There's been one engineer and the rest, yes, legions of lawyers. Uh, maybe in the FTC second century, it will get better. But I'd say mm -hmm. that if you want to be proficient in this area and be seen as proficient, there should be an urgency to make sure that on that board of five or on other boards of five or more, you've got at least one tech person who understands the technology Maybe someday that person would be the chair too. Yeah, five plus five. Rebecca. 
completely agree. Absolutely agree with the, the need for interdisciplinarity at all levels and in, in all of these questions. Um, and I, I do increasingly see that my CS students in my classroom are taking the course because they do genuinely see this as a, a viable career path for them. That as computer scientists, this is the world yeah. in which they're, they're going to put those skills to use. Obviously, to some extent, you know, who can lead law firms and so on it is a kind of regulatory question in terms of what qualifications you need to have. But the other point to make is that it's not just interdisciplinary teams. I think increasingly we're seeing interdisciplinary people. So the question of, you know, will it be a computer scientist who's leading? Well, there may not be such a thing as a pure computer scientist. There may be computer scientist lawyers. And increasingly, that's what we're seeing with the course. That in the first year, four years ago when it ran, we were very much getting people who only knew about their own disciplines. Increasingly, the people who want to take the course, they've worked as a lawyer in the tech startup. They've done some coding. They've been a computer scientist who's actually doing computer science and philosophy. And they've done maybe some legal work as well. So increasingly, I think we're not just seeing interdisciplinary teams, but actually interdisciplinary people. Yeah, so they may be the new the new cyborgs or the new kind of lawyers that we need, right? I always say to my students, don't be a dinosaur because dinosaurs, they tend to disappear. And here I would say being a dinosaur is to be just a lawyer or just a computer scientist. So uh, to both of you, uh, first of all, thank you very much for being on the panel, also for sitting on our advisory board. It was such a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. and. On that, we move on to the next panel. Um, what I will say, whilst the, the speakers are being promoted as a panelist, is that um, as we did the last two years, you will get no rest. We haven't planned any break for you to, to take a rest. So we'll go straight to, to panel number three. And this panel will be moderated not by me, finally, but by Bjorn, one of our editors which uh, give me the opportunity to say that um, the the project, the Computational Intelligence Project uh, really, really could not exist without uh, the leadership of uh, Theodora and uh, without the great editors that we have doing an amazing job when it comes to uh, editing all the papers, helping with the conference, coming up with new ideas. In 2024, we have so many sub projects that we want to introduce and they are made possible because of them. So Bjorn, I'm very happy to see you here. Uh, I see that all of the other speakers are being promoted as we speak. So finally, I can now uh, turn down the camera and uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much, um, Thibault. Thank you all for being here and uh, welcome to the agency carousel. So I'm going to share my screen just so that the magnificent slides that speakers have shared with me uh, can be seen. Is it the screen works. visible? Yes. Good, great. Okay. So the, the concept of this of this agency carousel is rather simple. Um, so like a real carousel, it turns around very quickly and uh, with four agencies from around the world um, hopping on and off the carousel, they will be quickly presenting their uh, use cases of computational antitrust. Um, so thank you uh, for the speakers um, for having made themselves available today. Um, and I think without further ado, we can actually hop on this regulatory merry-go-round and we'll start with Kevin. Uh, Kevin, who is a section chief at the Taiwan uh, Fair Trade Commission. Um, Kevin, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Kevin from the Taiwan Fair Trade Commission. I'm honored to participate in this conference and very pleased to be the first speaker of this section. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my presentation will be divided into three parts. First, how the TFTC applies algorithm-based systems to monitor markets. The second part is our uh, competition enforcement activities. And the last part is the TFTC following measures. Next slide, please. In 2022, the TFTC collaborated with external experts and economists to develop algorithm-based systems that were designed to monitor major daily necessities such as soybean, wheat, corn, and eggs. Uh, first, with the Q-learning algorithm, the 2022 price and output data in relevant markets were processed and used to test and adjust model 
uh, parameters. After repeating a large number of wrongs and learning with the simulator, we built a simulation model of vertical and horizontal concerted actions. The analytical results show that there was lack of evidence indicating the presence of collusion among suppliers of daily necessities. And second, uh, under the law of one price, the TFTC employed model of VAR and VECM, the Johansson co-integration test and the Granger causality test to analyze marketing margins of daily necessity. Here are the analytical results. For, uh, number one, uh, downstream prices of daily necessities did not efficiently reflect their respective upstream prices. One possible explanation was that the domestic supply of daily necessities was subject to import regulations on bulk grain. Second, prices of most daily necessities re remained relatively stable, but prices for some commodities, for example, milk and egg, eggs often rose faster than they fell. Next slide, please. And here are our experiences. Uh, number one, following the hypothetical monopoly test, the TFTC reviewed the data collected from consumer survey to define a relevant market. The result in indicated that the hypermarkets across the nation could be defined as a relevant product market. And number two, on the basis of the 2020 2022 price and output data, in the relevant market, the TFTC made use of the logistic regression model to analyze anti-competition effects arising from a proposed merger. The model suggested that the merger was likely to have anti-competitive effects as a result of the level of the increase in post-merger prices. Number three, the TFTC completed domestic retail store mapping with a geographic information system, GIS. The mapping result demonstrated that physical retail outlets were highly concentrated in metropolitan areas. Next slide, please. And here are our cases. Uh, number one, hypermarket mergers. The TFTC made attempt with different methods to sort where, warehouse and clean a large number of data sets, such as tax registrations for businesses and questionnaire survey results. These methods include web crawling, tax mining, and machine learning in R programming and Python. Regression models and critical loss analysis were implemented to define relevant markets. The analytical process starts with the hyper market sector that is the initial candidate market. The TFTC then calculated market share and market concentration, as well as assess unilateral effect and other anti-competitive effects. Number two, cinema mergers. A new concept used by the TFTC to define local markets in cinema mar mergers is isochrome-based catchment areas. First, the length of time or the distance customers would be willing to travel to reach the location of merging parties and other cinemas was determined. On account of the diversity of domestic transport modes for personal travel, walking, bicycle, car, bus, metro, and rail, the journey time or the distance was decided by the most commonly used transport modes. Isochromes were then constructed with GIS software to measure overlapping catchment areas of individual cinemas, assess the level of competition among cinemas and define geographic markets. Case number three, price fixing among ice making businesses on one offshore island, tools for extraction of digital evidence and digital forensics were used to acquire instant messaging chat from mobile devices owned by relevant businesses. 
TLTC cross-check lease communication histories and the dates of price increases and obtain direct evidence supporting price fixing. Number four, price fixing in carbonated drinks. Data warehousing and cleaning with our programming was applied to a large number of data sets around carbonated drinks. The impact of monthly changes was taken into consideration based on the interrupted time series approach to build a regression model for different types of carbonated drinks. The TFTC gauged the elasticity of demand by evaluating the differences in outcomes before and after price adjustments. The TFTC further compared the elasticity of demand and the extent of increase in prices to review whether price adjustments were considered economically rational. Next slide, please. In the future, the TFTC will take measures to enhance the effectiveness of antitrust enforcement activity and continue technology capacity building in its law enforcement. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Kevin. And I I know you're you're it's very late where you are right now. So thanks a lot for staying up and uh, having made yourself available. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So um, that was our first agency, and now we're hopping onto the carousel again with uh, Felipe, who is the acting head of the Market Studies Division at the Chile National Economic Prosecutor. Hi, Felipe. Hi, Bjorn. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so hello, everyone. It is a great honor to uh, join you today at the third annual conference on computational antitrust. I would like to extend my gratitude to the computational antitrust team for orchestrating this innovative and timely event. So today, my discussion will center on how the Fiscalía Nacional Económica, the FNE, is assimilating AI-based technologies developed in-house into its operations, as evidenced through the initiatives of our intelligence unit. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Sir? I think he's frozen. <laughs> now? Yeah, I come. I think he's not moving anymore. Um, let's hope that it will return. In just a second. But yeah, it's gone. Can you? Do you have access to you to the share function by by any chance? In my computer, yes. Do you have your slides? Oh. Yes. Yes, I can share them. Yes, yeah, in one second. Best. Yes, give me one second. Of course. It's always great in a conference when you talk about technology to be tested in front of the <sighs> audience, right? Can you run a PowerPoint presentation or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Bjorn is back, but... So do you see my presentation? Now? Yes, we do. Yeah, perfect. Great. So let's a uh, quickie glance at what I'll be covering today in these few minutes. I'll start with an introduction to the FNE uh, Intelligence Unit, followed by insights into two AI systems they have developed, Jarvis for market monitoring and Augurio for forensic analysis. Lastly, we'll discuss why the Intelligence Unit uh, thought developing these systems in-house was the best path forward. So this unit was uh, launched in September 2020 and comprises a data scientist slash economist, a software developer, and a lawyer, uh, the head of the unit. This multidisciplinary team focuses on cartel detection and developing investigative methods and tools for analyzing a uh, vast amounts of data, both structured and unstructured. These methods and tools can be used uh, by either the anti-cartel division or other divisions within the FNA. Its creation is a pivotal, pivotal step in the agency's ongoing efforts to actively combat uh, cartels and align its investigative techniques with global standards. 
Uh, so let's delve into Jarvis. This is a system that scrapes content from uh, various online news outlets uh, uh, to create tailored news feeds. It employs uh, custom trained natural language processing models for pinpointing relevant news. It has a graphic user interface that allows uh, our legal professionals to efficiently build uh, training sets that then can be used to train text classifiers for their own needs. Although our agency currently employs a, a news piece provider that categorizes content via keywords, Jarvis is conceived to take a step further by discerning the deeper meaning within the text um, with a context aware filtration. So this system was uh, launched this year and has been used thus far to monitor in news procedural gun jumping. To date, no formal actions have commenced. However, the FNA is now actively monitoring such behavior, a process that was impractical before due to constrained resources. So uh, in this video, we are displaying the, the graphical user interface that our lawyers utilize for constructing their training sets. The interface facilitates the creation of bespoke uh, text classifier by allowing them to label news uh, items as relevant or irrelevant. Additionally, they, they have the option to directly access the source uh, should they need to investigate a specific issue further. So next, next uh, le let's talk about Augurio. This is a tool uh, used in the forensic analysis phase of cartel investigations for pinpointing di digital image evidence. While our agency possesses commercial tools for retrieving and analyzing digital content from seized devices, these are not tailored to filter images pertinent to our investigations. Primarily, they focus on identifying content relevant to criminal cases, such as images depicting nudity or violence. In cartel investigations, however, we often seek images like handwritten notes, photos of spreadsheets, or graphs. Prior to Augurio, this necessitated manually uh, reviewing tens of thousands of images, a process that was not only laborious, but also susceptible to errors. So equipped with a suite of image classifiers, each aligned with a distinct investigative goal, Augurio has streamlined our workflow, cutting down weeks of labor-intensive uh, tasks. So this efficiency has allowed our investigators to focus on more complex aspects of their cases. And here in this video, we are uh, presenting a sample of images used for testing purposes. Let's see if I can minimize this. No, here. Uh, so uh, you will notice that the relevant images are sorted into two distinct folders. One calls uh, pertinent visual content, while the other is dedicated to images containing text. Uh, so then the question is, why opt for in-house development of these uh, systems? The driving uh, factors are cost effectiveness and the ability to, to customize. Of the shelf commercial tools uh, often come with a hefty price tag and may not be adequately uh, suited for the nuanced demands of uh, antitrust investigation. The intelligence unit strategy leverage uh, the wealth of freely available online resources to develop AI-based tools. This approach has enabled us to tailor uh, uh, solutions that greatly enhance our efficiency and monitoring prowess while adhering to our budget constraints. So it, it does, however, require to us to cultivate engineering expertise internally. So I hope in these few minutes I have been able to successfully communicate the efforts of the FNA, uh, especially within the intelligence unit. And thank you for your attention and I'm eager to learn from the insights of the other panel uh, participants, essential participants. Thank you very much, Felipe. Uh, apologies for the slight internet glitch, uh, but it was very nice to, to catch those little videos, uh, which give it a bit of a hands-on uh, touch. Um, Unfortunately, Martina uh, could not make it uh, tonight, uh, but Mateus has uh, kindly offered to step in. Uh, he is a chief expert at Poland's Office of Competition and Consumer Protection, and he will be presenting 
his use case of computational antitrust. Yes. Could I ask for the slides of my presentation? Um, have you have you communicated the slides to us? I, I don't think. Perhaps perhaps you could present them. Yeah, of course, of course. Could, could, could I upload here the presentation? Because I cannot see this possibility. You should normally be able to share your screen. There's a green button. Otherwise, I can also first hop to Susanna, and then we can get back to you, Matthias, if you okay. prefer. Let's do that. Um, okay, let's let's then switch around and have someone else hop on the carousel. Um, so Susanna is the head of economic of the economic intelligence unit at the Spanish Competition Authority. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna, um, for being here. I will share your slides right away. Uh, let's go. Yeah. There we go. Yep. I think it's that one. Okay. So thank you very much and good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you and, and thanks for inviting us. Um, yes, could could you go to the next slide because I will go quite quick because of the 10, 10 constraints. So as all of you or quite a lot of you may know, the Economic Intelligence Unit in Spain was created in 2018. The team is quite different to the usual ones for competition authorities. As it was said in the previous panel, uh, we are uh, lawyers, economists, and but also at the same time, we have mathematicians, the statistics people, and engineers and data scientists. So it's quite different. And I think uh, that's one of the, the best uh, the best uh, things that they that we have. These are the goals that we, we try to achieve. And mainly the one that I'm going to, to stop today is uh, the use of statistical business intelligence and artificial intelligence techniques, uh, mainly to detect with rigging. Um, could, could we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, these are really, really simple uh, statistical tools or, or it was the, like the very beginning of the unit. It was um, a, a quick view to, to different uh, data and analyze different patterns. And it was like the first um, the first moment that we, we used and we realized about the potential of the data. Uh, next slide, please. These uh, were used, this kind of, of, of models were used for different uh, actual cases and uh, they are sanctioned and I will not stop here. But the main goal, and next slide please. The main, the main goal was uh, to, to detect with rigging, as I was saying, uh, just for to having a, a small background on the Spain situation of public procurement, I I think that it's a quite positive situation regarding other countries because uh, we we have the public procurement platform with a central database. The regional platforms that we have nineteen have to be connected. This could be quite a lot of talk about this because there's mm, they do not share all the information and it's more complex. But let's say that all you know we have quite a very good information information about public procurement since 2015 the cnmc decided to download the, the this information of public procurement rather the structured information that is to say for instance the the the, the b the company awardee the different ministries all of this uh, structured data but also the unstructured data as could be tender documents award notices PDFs, Excels, uh, even pictures, images, all of that. We, we downloaded everything, we cleaned all the data. And I have written the, that um, the information about non-winning bids and non-winning bidders 
um, are not included, included publicly. That is to say that the general public, they do not have that information. But this year we reached an agreement with the Ministry of Finance. So we do have that. Uh, so for all of you, you, you can understand the importance of that. It's, it's almost to say that it's, it's almost gold for, for, for public procurement data. So all in all, we have about 3 million tenders information. So that's uh, the very beginning. Uh, it was, we, we think that it was a very, very good starting point. Next slide, please. So having that in mind, we develop quite a lot of different, um, quite a lot of different tools. I will not stop in all of that, in all of them, because of the time restraints. Uh, first, Gimme, it's a, it's a, an instant search, a tool for instant searches on tenders. We use also natural language processing for that. Uh, we use Power BI, Microsoft Power BI for for the visualization and analysis. We have coded more than 17 variables for, for like screening variables. And the, the point that I would like to stop today or, or to try to, to explain a little bit more is the machine learning process, sorry, ma machine learning program that we have developed uh, uh, with all of this other information with other, the other pillars. And it's uh, based on the CNMC data, data sets that we have created with the bid rigging cases that have been found by the CNMC. So keep in, please, could you go to the to the next slide, please? Next, yes, so keeping that in mind, keeping that, that we have all the information of public procurement since 2015 already clean, already downloaded, and also that we have a good repository of sanctioned cases, we could develop this bid rigging detector based on machine learning. Next slide, please. I will go quite quite quick. Uh, the main goal of this uh, machine learning detector is uh, detector bit rigging detector is give for each tender the probability of being collusive. Uh, we did uh, we we trained the different algorithms. We tried different algorithms in Python with the eighty percent of the data, and we test with the rest of the twenty percent. We tried different methods. Uh, we tried uh, with the data set of the CNMC. And we selected the model and we tried with raw variables and also with the screens and without the screens that I mentioned before. And all in all, I have to say that uh, it's uh, about the, the, the because you have different uh, different indicators, but we consider that it's up, upon 90% uh, of, of success uh, of, the, of the detection success. Please, could you go to the next slide? I think this is yeah it, this is already the the the, the last one so as i said we used um, different variables raw variables from the public procurement but also for companies uh, for companies that we have uh, all another database that is also integrated on our database uh, we use also the screening variables that are we already coded the the usual ones like a statistical ones but other that are created ad hoc by by the cnmc and next slide, please. And as I said, we we coded everything. And the good thing is that we have already tried this uh, tool with uh, really recent cases, really bid rigging sanction, really recent cases that the tool had not seen them before. And um, and the rate of success is quite good. We are quite positive and we are, we are quite happy about the results that we are obtaining. So. For the moment, it's, uh, it's, uh, we think that it's a, a very great future for our tool, at least the data um, show that. And I think that's the, the last slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. And also, thank you for, for the detailed view into this, uh, this new machine learning algorithm. Um, I think Timo has located the slides. So he Perfect. Uh, Mateus, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to give my brief presentation today. Uh, as a chief expert at Polish Office of Competition and Consumer Protection, I'll share with you a few insights on the development and use of computational tools in Poland. The first tool is being developed for bid rigging detection. It's based on statistical analyzation uh, and comparison of calculation results. 
Ultimately, its aim is to help us detect collusive behavior by analyzing late or large data sets. For example, for large infrastructure projects, data provided by the General Directorate for National Roads and Motorways contained over 3,000 offers submitted. Polish Competition Authority also conducts research on the implementation of mechanism for preliminary assessment of the risk of bid rigging. Its goal would be to identify the areas prone to collusive tendering. Although we have a prototype tool which allows data analysis, the basic problem is the availability of high quality data on the public procurement markets. In order to develop appropriate databases, we initiated cooperation with the public procurement office so we could obtain more data from online procurement system. What is also important, uh, we are looking towards the development of a common bit rigging detection tool on the EU level, such a tool developed by all members of European Competition Network shall within a few years make it possible to conduct structural and behavioral screening across the EU. As a result, all EU member states could more easily identify markets prone to collusions or detect unusual behavior that may be resulted from anti-competitive agreements. What's also worth mentioning, Polish Competition Authority is uh, responsible for protection of consumer and their rights as well. This is why we have also developed a tool based on AI for the detection of abusive clauses. The system is based on machine learning and involves natural language processing and computer vision. It's used for text analysis of contract templates and searching for prohibited clauses. Next slide, please. Although these uh, steps are significant, uh, they're just a, a small part of what future will require from competition law enforcers, including, of course, Polish Competition Authority. And taking today's opportunity, I'd like to share with you what other computational tools are the most needed for the protection of competition in Poland and most likely in other countries. First, as a case handler at New Technologies Unit, I strongly believe that each competition authority shall have a specific tool for automatic analysis of prices and their dynamics across most of the products sold online. Although many such initiatives have been taken already, the anti-competitive views of pricing parallel and signaling algorithms by multiple companies facilitates illegal arrangements, uh, make collusion more efficient and help such firms avoid price competition. Second, Polish Competition Authority is looking forward to work on developing more advanced tools for economic analysis. For example, such a tool shall help us more easily and in involving less resources to indicate in a comprehensively manner the whole structure of a market. While conducting my PhD research on barriers to entry in digital markets, I've learned how analysis of entries and exits might be essential percent characteristics of a given market. Making this process automatic may be crucial for the efficiency of economic analysis in competition law cases and when identifying markets with the biggest structural competition problems. Last but not least, I'd like to point out that we also recognize a significant potential for the use of computational tools in analysis of evidence. For example, each down rate faces a key challenge, which is identification of relevant evidence and selection of most important examples. Although we already use advanced software for such purposes, we still perceive significant opportunities to make it quicker and engaging lower amount of stuff involved. And uh, last slide, please. And that is the end uh, of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And it was a pleasure to give this brief uh, information to you.
Thank you very much, Matthias, and and thank you so much for for having made yourself available on such short notice. So no that, <laughs> that, that concludes our our agency carousel. Thank you all for having uh, spoken and presented uh, your short use case uh, within the short time frame in this very quick uh, carousel. Um, just to to tell everyone, all all the agencies that have spoken um, tonight or this morning, depending on where you are um have contributed to our second uh, annual report um so if you want to read that uh, you can find a link in the chat or in the youtube video that will be uploaded and i think i can uh, give it back to tibo yes indeed so again thank you very much to all of you um i mean i can't comment on you all but just maybe in the words what you're doing in in chile and uh, in taiwan i think is very advanced susanna the accuracy that you presented is super high right as a lawyer if we could get as accurate this would be quite something um and uh to 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 you matthews i mean uh, i was with you in poland just a couple of days ago and i was very impressed by what you do and also the dynamism that you inject in the region when it comes to competition on tech so on behalf of uh, all of us here, thank you so very much. And uh, now we move on to the very next panel. But once again, I am very pleased not to be moderating the panel, not because I don't like to moderate panels, but because I know that the moderator is a great moderator. She was moderating a panel last year. And uh, also, I think two years ago, Alexandra, if you are uh, still with us, hopefully you are, the floor will be yours in the meantime. I can sing a song if you all want. One, two, three. No. All right. I won't do that. Um, all right. Good to see you. Good to see you, both of you. Uh, I'll shut down the camera and pass the floor to Alexandra. Thank you, Thibault. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, but especially for your trust and for the opportunity um, to moderate this very important panel. Um, it is true, it's my third conference, and I'm so happy to see uh, that the project, how the project has grown so far. Um, I shared the exact same impression as Theodora um, mm -hmm. that three years ago, the use of AI in antitrust was still considered as experimental and today it has become a reality. And it is thanks to computational antitrust uh, project. Um, today with our esteemed speakers, we will navigate you through the intricacies of the use of the AI by antitrust agencies. Uh, we will go through different examples of applications of AI in competition enforcement and analyze its challenges. I am thrilled to work, welcome our today's speakers, Maria Teresa Maggiolino, uh, Associate Professor at Bocconi University, Renato Nazzini, uh, Professor of Law at, at King's College London, uh, Herrick Hoffman, Professor at the University of Luxembourg, and finally, uh, Isabella Lorenzoni, a PhD candidate at the University of uh, Luxembourg. Um, if you followed us uh, last year and two years ago, you might notice that the format of our panel has changed. Uh, there will be no presentations of the papers and we'll start directly with the questions. So before I kick off the discussion with the very first question, allow me to briefly present the papers that our speakers wrote and that are either already available um, on our website or that will be published there very soon. Um, the first paper was uh, written by Herwig Hoffman and Isabella Lorenzoni, uh, and they wrote about the future challenges for automation in competition law enforcement. Uh, the article offers an overview of how and when competition authorities uh, apply AI in their enforcement. Hervig and Isabella list challenges that NCAs can encounter. Uh, they shed more light on the integration of automatic decision making uh, into competition law enforcement and dwell into the issue of human discretion and the principle of a right to a reasoned decision. 
Secondly, uh, we have Maria Teresa Maggiolino and her paper on indeterminate antitrust concepts and artificial intelligence, uh, the case of plausibility. Uh, the paper does a deep dive into the concept of plausibility in competition law and unpacks the potential of AI to help interpret the notion of plausibility. Maggie develops an idea that AI can help us construct one, uh, on one hand, um, case-based notion of plausibility, and on the other hand, economic-driven notion of plausibility. Uh, finally, we have Renato Nazzini and James Henderson, um, who wrote about overcoming the current knowledge gap of algorithmic collusion and the role of computational antitrust. Uh, the authors bring up uh, the concept of algorithmic pricing and analyze the risk of collusive scenarios. Renato and James uh, reveal how one should review uh, algorithmic processing systems by introducing the techniques such as empirical and technical audits. Let me remind our participants that they are very welcome to ask questions in the Q&A section. Um, let's start the discussion with uh, Hervik's and Isabella's uh, paper. Um, so in your paper, you, you talk uh, a lot about the automated decision-making, the ADM. And since not everyone in the audience has read your paper, uh, could you please um, give concrete examples of how the ADM can be implemented in competition law these days? You can also briefly introduce the, introduce the concept, but I think we have already extensively talked about it in, in previous panels. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Thibault and everyone for inviting us to this conference. Um, so the, in our paper, we discuss the use of uh, automated decision making. So the use of AI systems in general you, to uh, the process of uh, um, decision making, which in general uh, consisted of different phases and uh, AI systems can be used in each of these, uh, these phases in general is not used for all the procedure. And if you think of uh, a typical decision-making cycle in uh, competition law enforcement, uh, for example, the initiation phase, the investigation phase, um, decision-making monitoring, AI systems can be used in every of these, uh, of these phase. Uh, for example, in the initiation phase, um, some competition authorities already use uh, screening tools with uh, machine learning systems uh, that uh, um, are used as a proactive tool to raise the uh, red flags of uh, unusual behaviors that might be an anti-competitive behavior. And uh, in the investigation phase, for example, they use uh, document management software to handle uh, a huge amount of data, uh, documents from uh, uh, the defendants uh, or acquired during down raids. And uh, here, this uh, software, instead of using only basic keywords, they can function with more sophisticated AI systems, such as, such as natural languages processing. For example, to identify documents protected by legal professional privilege or uh, for uh, privacy and data protection purposes. Then in the decision making process, uh, for example, past uh, antitrust cases could be used as an input data to train algorithms and analyze elements that drove decisions in past cases. And this is also to ensure that uh, similar cases can be treated in similar way. And finally, in the monitoring phase, uh, advanced computational tools uh, can be used to monitor compliance uh, with uh, certain remedies. And this might be useful uh, when uh, there are digital companies involved, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. It was very interesting. Thank you for walking us through the different phases uh, in which AI can be used. Um, I would like to direct my next question to Renato. Um, with James, you focused on algorithmic collusion. Um, it's basically automated decision uh, making, but uh, used by companies and not by antitrust agencies. Um, algorithmic collusion was on everyone's lips back in 2016 uh, when Virtual Competition Book was published. Um, the book discussed the promises and perils of algorithmic driven uh, economy. But algorithmic collusion received some criticisms in academia, pointing out that there is no conclusive empirical evidence evidence. So where do we stand now with algorithmic pricing and competition law? Uh, what has sh uh, changed since then and what's the state of play? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, and thank you very much to you and, and Thibault for, for, for the invitation. And thank you uh, everybody who is with us this morning or this evening. I hope you can he all hear me. 
Um, I, I, I think uh, the point is exactly the one you made. I mean, I think we don't understand enough about algorithmic collusion and algorithmic pricing. But we know that there is uh, a lot of it going on, not only on uh, in e-commerce, where obviously any we have now very clear evidence that any um, seller of any significance, probably about with a, a turnover of uh, above one million, as we. We, we, we have references in the paper, etc. I mean, ca cannot do without algorithmic pricing. We, we, we do know that basically these prices uh, for a product, I mean, there are millions and millions and millions of pricing changes um, every hour on, uh, on the internet that have to be um, uh, understood and, and, and potentially analyzed. So um, we uh, we quite simply don't have enough evidence, I agree, and we don't have enough evidence, I would suggest one way or the other, we don't have enough evidence that there is pervasive algorithmic collusion and therefore a significant problem. Equally, we don't have enough evidence that there is no problem at all here, and we can just turn a blind eye to what is now a fundamentally pervasive sector of our economy. Um, we certainly do have, um, I, I would suggest now, some good papers, not legal papers, because frankly, I'm a lawyer and I have been a lawyer for now the good part of almost 30 years. But I, I have to say that I'm uh, James Henderson, my co-author, is not a lawyer. He's, uh, a, 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 he's a, by training, he's an engineer and a scientist although he now wants to be a barrister, hence <laughs> moving towards the law, but he has a scientific background. There is only as much that uh, we as lawyers can say in this, in, in this area, but the, um, the economic literature has identified both empirically and uh, uh, in terms of models, uh, settings in which algorithmic collusion can indeed uh, can indeed take place. Uh, we, we have some examples in, in our paper, but for, for, for instance, uh, Miklos Tal and Taka, a very good paper in 2019, Conclusion by Algorithm uh, in uh, Biting and Safi as well, 2021 paper, and others. I, I, I don't want to do injustice to anybody. So our one of the main points that we make, and I, I was very pleased to, to hear the carousel uh, of uh, uh, competition agencies before that was very interesting one of the main points that i would make we make in the paper is that now competition authorities are, are starting equipping themselves with the tools to understand these markets better we need to understand them better we need the data we need pervasive data obviously not just a couple of bid rigging cases here and there and we need much more than that. It will not take weeks. It will not take months, maybe. But equally, it, it cannot take 10 years because these things are happening, are happening now. Thank you very much, Renato. Um, my next question goes to Maggie, uh, who also focused on tools, different tools that competition authorities uh, can equip themselves to understand better the market. Um, you focused on the notion of uh, plausibility. So could you please, please tell us why you decided to focus on the notion of plausibility? And uh, I think it's also a great opportunity to, to introduce the concept to our participants. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alexandra, and thank you, Thibault, and everybody else who is here. Um, yeah, well, when I decided to write the paper, I moved from a very simple observation that antitrust rules, much like any other legal rule and any other um, human language uh, statement, uh, are uh, do contain a lot of concepts uh, whose meaning is uncertain. It is vague. It is uh, ambiguous. Plausibility is one of them. Actually, people do not really know what plaus what plausibility stands for. What does it mean? And, uh, this, and the reason why I gave so much importance to plausibility is that it is present both in substantive and procedural rules, both in US and EU antitrust law. For example, consider that in EU competition law, when dealing with cases where only circumstantial evidence is uh, available, cartels are deemed proved only if there is no other plausible explanation for the observed facts. Similarly, 
under U.S. antitrust law only claims to show plausible reasons to infer illicit behavior and consider worthy of, party, of, of further examination. And the substantive law put back the new competition law, for example, in relation to the concept of potential competition, it, it is said that potential competition exists when it is plausible that competitors will enter the relevant, the relevant market. So now this concept, whose meaning is indeterminate, is uncertain, is present both in procedural rules that are that aims at ascertaining, at detecting facts, and in substantial rules that somehow may have, or sometimes may have, also normative meaning, also the, 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 the goal of driving the market, uh, sorry, driving the market, um, or the or the behavior of the human agents or firms towards some specific goals. So I, I thought that um, testing uh, AI tools, uh, AI tools uh, to, to 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 interpret this notion that plays so many rules within antitrust law could be um, a good exercise. Yeah, this is a very good point. And that's also, um, I have a follow-up uh, question about that. Uh, because uh, when I read your paper, I realized like how important it is uh, to have this objective understanding of uh, plausibility in order to fairly apply uh, the law. So the question is then, how can NI um, help with establishing an objective notion of plausibility? Well, um, let me get started from a very simple idea. Um, Right now, plausibility is used to dismiss scenarios that are perceived as mere possibilities or pure speculations, as opposed to scenarios that we perceive as normal, usual, common, ordinary, or even natural. Now, clearly enough, every human being may have different conceptualization of what is normal, usual, common, ordinary, and even natural. More importantly, this different conceptualization may result not only from objective facts, scientific laws, generalization, valid generalizations, but also from personal experiences, beliefs, prejudice, and even common assumptions. Therefore, as you were saying, we need a shared notion of plausibility, not only for the sake of fairness, but also to control and even rule out the amount of knowledge, which is not rooted in hard science, or which is even um, the result of prejudice. Now, the question becomes, what can AI do in order to help us achieving this notion? Well, in my paper, I developed two possibilities. One way to create or to develop this notion of possibility is combining string searching algorithms and natural language processing algorithms and supervised algorithms to describe to, to come up with a notion of plausibility that allows us uh, to uh, understand the factors the parameters that antitrust decision makers both courts and authorities use have historically employed over the years to define what plausibility is uh, and the relative, and we can use these algorithms to understand, to assess the weight of these different factors, and also to classify them either among the factual elements or among those who are value-driven elements. And so, on the basis of the case law, we could use uh, AI to create a bottom-up notion of plausibility that obviously remains uh, is uh, the result of what has been decided so far. Otherwise, on, on well, I mean, uh, differently, on the other hand, we could develop using uh, um, what we call representation and reasoning AI, an economic driven notion of plausibility, meaning we could uh, develop algorithms that uh, are based on uh, economic principles and economic rules in order to develop a notion of plausibility that mirrors and reflects our economic understanding of what is usual, normal, natural, and so on. 
that's that's very interesting. Um, it actually reminds me of the fact that AI necessarily entails some some challenges. And uh, Isabella and Hervik studied in detail uh, this this question and different challenges of computational computational antitrust. So Hervik, Isabella, what do you think are the biggest challenges that competition authorities face, and how to overcome them? Thank you. I will take this question, Hervik, if you if you agree. Um, I think that uh, in this very moment, uh, the biggest challenge is that competition authorities face uh, is a technical challenge, which is the lack of available data. Uh, for example, there was a um, in the conference in the ECN conference. Uh, it was said that uh, there is a paradox uh, between uh, ubiquity of data and the scarcity of data, and the lack of data represent uh, um, uh, the main challenges I think for competition authorities. Um, and this is uh, in uh, three different uh, um, three different problems create. Uh, one is uh, the fact that they don't have access to private companies' um, data. So the data uh, such as cost, product quantities, because obviously companies are reluctant to share uh, to competition authorities their data if they don't have an RFI. Another important uh, problem is the lack of a complete and unbiased data set. So having a data set uh, reliable, unbiased, uh, with enough uh, examples of collusion and non-collusion that they can rely on to train algorithms. And then another problem that uh, came up by some competition authorities during the interviews that I conducted with uh, some of them is the fact that uh, they don't have uh, structured data. So the problem to transform structured data uh, in uh, that comes in with the PDF format in uh, um, uh, a structured data readable for machine learning systems, for example, in Excel files, because otherwise uh, they have to uh, do that uh, manually to transform uh, all the data, all the documents, uh, trillions of documents in PDF to Excel files. And this uh, is a huge uh, problem for competition authorities. And I think that uh, to overcome this, uh, uh, one of the, the possible solution that has been suggested also in the uh, in the previous panel is to cooperation, not only with competition authorities, but also with uh, public authorities to exchange data. Uh, I think this might be important also in the light of the recent data act. And uh, I think that also uh, exchange data with academia, uh, maintain the dialogue with academia can be really important because scholars collect data for research purpose. They use it, uh, of course, for research, um, to, for research purpose, but can be used by competition authorities uh, in real case scenario. So I think that is the main uh, way to go to overcome such issues. Thank, thank you for, for your contribution. I think this is a recurring issue in all of the articles that the problem is the, the lack of data. And uh, you all, some of you make the argument that we need a lot of good data to make a meaningful change in, in antitrust enforcement. So my question, which is actually addressed to all of you, um, how can the agencies collect uh, good data? And this is also if you want to react to what Isabella just said. So do you think it's a good idea that uh, agencies cooperate and uh, there should be some kind of um, data pool uh, for agencies. Uh, I don't know, maybe Hervik, you would like to react. Now, um, uh, having data is, of course, absolutely necessary for any decision making, especially in the competition area where we need market data, we need pricing data, we need comparable data out of certain areas. Even to identify a market, we need a lot of data simply to to see, for example, how would price changes affect markets and so on. That's all well known. So far, the competition authorities have gotten along quite well, often also simply employing um, private expertise for that. Um, when you look at uh, availability of data for computational antitrust um, using algorithms, of course, they rely on much more uh, information um, than um, humanly was processed in the past. And the difficulty is, you know, they own, computational antitrust only has an advantage if it can um, increase the quantity of data and the quality of analysis. 
by comparison to a human. That's the, the key why we want to have computational antitrust, why, why, where the advantages are. But in, in order to get that, um, one would need to either have more transparency on the market for the public enforcers. And it's an interesting, if you compare, for example, financial supervision with classic antitrust area, in financial supervision, more and more market participants are obliged to share nearly in real time their data with the authorities and um, uh, basically have authorities software being plugged into individual data transactions. That's one way of doing things. Um, another way has just been uh, uh, mentioned, which is interagency cooperation. Their, their latest wave of European digital legislation, uh, Isabella was mentioning the Data Act, but also there's an Interoperability Act coming up. Um, it's a horrible mass of, of, of legislation at the moment in the pipeline. It's hard to keep up. But those types of um, approaches try to harmonize the way data are processed, harmonize the way data are reported, and therefore increase the usability as well as the data quality. Hopefully the quality that is, because um, with poor data quality, of course, no good decisions can come out. And um, that's so far the biggest challenge, I think, next to the data availability is to ensure the data quality. Uh, yes, you're you're completely right. Um, Renata, what, what do you think about it? Uh, do you think pulling uh, data together would, is a good idea? Do you think maybe competition authorities should jointly develop the same algorithms to actually exploit the data uh, better? What what are the possible obstacles? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think that eventually or pull some kind of data pooling uh, from competition authorities is quite necessary because we have seen that actually, um, based on experience so far, it's quite difficult to get sufficient good data within a given jurisdiction. And of course, this is particularly problematic for smaller jurisdictions. So are we talking about the United States or are we talking about, I don't know, the Netherlands or Switzerland, right? So um, uh, it, it, obviously, there, are, there will have to be a number of conditions for that to happen. So first of all, if uh, competition authorities have, are to share data and good data, they have to get this data in the first place. Now, they, they, they can, of course, get it through their investigations. But for example, I mean, we, we have seen that so far, again, based on experience, um, yeah, there have been interesting cases here and there, uh, and one, 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 you have one of these cases, everybody in the world talks about it, but in reality, uh, these cases about uh, um, um, where AI tools have been used and etc. Are, 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 are still quite rare. And, and also, you know, data from cartels, you know, from the vitamins cartel, you know, uh, are not necessarily very useful to detect nowadays cartels. So um, competition authorities need to get good data, including good data about uh, online pricing and so on. So we, we have to think about, I believe, whether competition authorities should be given new powers uh, um, not necessarily in an investigation, but as was said before by Herbig, actually, uh, to just find out, sort of fact-finding um, exercises in their own jurisdictions. This, of course, and especially if then this data is going to be shared with competition authorities outside the jurisdiction, this must come with safeguards in terms of uh, possibly anonymity, and in, in use of this data, because of course we need also to protect the um, the, inter the legitimate interests of those companies or those firms whose data are used, particularly if at the end of the day, these companies have done nothing wrong. Uh, remember that, you know, for example, to, to train algorithms uh, as to whether certain uh, online pricing is predatory pricing or is collusive or not, you need examples of collusive uh, outcomes, predatory pricing, and also examples of perfectly legitimate prices. Um, and, and also, and, and the other thing I would say, um, we then need to uh, be very careful in terms of adjusting this data to different market realities. And for example, there has been a recent study in relation to um, possible collusive outcomes in bid, uh, bidding markets in Switzerland and Japan. And what has been seen is that the um, uh, uh, the 
the the kind of closeness of bids um, that would be consistent with the collusive outcome in Switzerland and in Japan is different. So in Japan, even in uh, perfectly competitive settings, uh, probably because there is more market transparency, uh, uh, for, for whatever reasons, um, uh, bids tend to be actually closer to each other and, and, and variances are, are lower compared, for example, to Switzerland. Now, this was studied and accounted for, so all is possible, but it's um, uh, it, it's not straightforward. And, 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 and one does wonder, I mean, I, I was in a competition authority, although now it's becoming quite a long time ago, I have to say, and we weren't talking about computational antitrust at the time, but uh, uh, there is certainly an issue of resources and, um, and, and costs uh, associated with all of that. But it seems, again, from the carousel before, the competition authorities are investing in this area now. Thank you. I think it's very important to also talk about smaller uh, authorities that, and they particularly face indeed the problem of scarcity of of, of resources. And um, Maggie, I have a question for you now. Um, in your paper, you indeed you talked about the driven uh, and the case based notion of plausibility. So since authorities face this problem of limited resources and they could only um, develop one of them, uh, which do you think would be a bigger help to to antitrust um, agents? Well, uh, generally, I stand for the economic-driven uh, uh, notion of plausibility for a very, very traditional reason. Uh, if antitrust law is meant to protect the market well functioning, and if economics is the social science which is in the best place to explain the market well functioning, I believe that we should use economics to understand what is normal, usual, common, ordinary, in one word, what is plausible. Uh, so I think that uh, in, as uh, analyzing cases uh, and with um, computational tools would be very costly for authorities, uh, creating uh, an economic driven notion of plausibility by an algorithm would be easier and could be used in any jurisdiction because economics as a diff is different from law as long as it is universal. What makes economic sense in the U.S. makes economic sense in the U.S. and so on. Uh, so this is the, the main reason, practical reason why, and even theoretical reason why one could stand for uh, this economic-driven notion of plausibility. However, um, when we deal with the plausibility and we introduce it within procedural rules, we use it to rule out scenarios which are not empirically possible. Now, uh, economics is, is a value-driven uh, science. I mean, it's not a piece of art science like physics, mathematics. Yeah? It, it is imbued with the values. And so if we choose to use the economic notion of plausibility, and to use it with same procedural rules, it means that we select the reality that makes more economic sense on the basis of values, not only on the basis of facts. And this is um, a choice that has already been made by human beings uh, in many cases, but still uh, this should be a choice we, we should be aware of. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, Isabella and Hervik also argued that um, the automatic decision making might limit uh, human discretion of, of case handlers. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you whether limiting enforcers discretion uh, is a good thing. Um, should we create um, any obligation uh, for enforcers to explain the reasons why they decided to deviate from the outcome proposed by the by the AI? So uh, let me briefly go one step back before we start with discretion, because um, we have to think of, when we're thinking of public enforcement, obviously that's where this, this notion comes. Um, we have to think of the fact that we want and we require from a decision to be properly reasoned. It needs to be reasoned with regard to the exercise of all of the requirements which go in and also the procedural requirements. 
So it needs to show the market analysis, the reasoning. It needs to show um, what uh, wrongdoing has occurred and what problems came out and how the facts are linked to the to the outcome and how that is overall a proportionate decision in the context of, of these facts. So that makes the overall discretion. The discretion happens within the procedure at many points. It's the discretion of the choice of selection of the investigation tools, and it's a choice of economic models to, to analyze. Even though the courts review that aspect a bit more, they still grant a certain amount. And then it comes to the, the decision and the outcome and so on. So we have discretion on a whole spectrum of, of elements. Discretion is not a unitary element. So when we look at this whole spectrum, um, de facto, when we have computational antitrust, when we have met tools which allow for an analysis of markets, for example, or of the analysis of certain anomalities of market behavior, um, these might have a very persuasive force and um, therefore lead de facto to a officer in a, a case handler to suggest a certain outcome because the person, the individual, the human, would not have the possibility to de novo review all of this fact analysis, which is done by the computational analysis. So even if theoretically the human would have the possibility and the right to override and decide differently, de facto, and with all the pressure of time as well as you know the risk of, of outcome, if a, if, a, if a case handler, an officer says, listen, this is what our a uh, well-calibrated uh, uh, AI system here suggests, and I follow it, is on the safe side, or she, and uh, if she would deviate, she might be subject to a lot of um, internal pressure, even, you know, even if she could analyze, analyze all of those um, pre-requirements uh, herself or himself. So um, de facto, uh, there is a limitation of discretion if you have a uh, complex analysis of complex facts by a um, uh, automated system. What's the way out? The way out is to ensure that the there's transparency in the individual decision as to what is the input and what is the output and why are they related, which has to be programmed, by the way. We have to make sure that our computational AI systems actually allow for this knowledge, which in the moment is very rarely the case. And the other thing is that we understand what is actually the software in the AI tool. It is similar to administrative rulemaking, to soft law. We have internal administrative guidelines. Right? That's de facto what it does, because it makes these abstract terms, which uh, Maria Teresa was, was describing, more concrete towards an individual decision. So it has the same effect as administrative rulemaking, and so therefore, at least in legal systems where we have transparency requirements for those administrative rulemaking structures, that should also be applied in the area of, of computational antitrust. Thank you. I, I think it's it's very in, important what you, what you said, and uh, it actually made me think about the procedural right, rights and whether the, the current uh, competition procedural rule book is uh, actually uh, well made for the developments, for the recent developments that uh, we are uh, observing right now. Um, so it's a question that is addressed to all of you. Um, could you think of one procedural right that should emerge with the development of AI and, of course, being creative and original? Is, is very welcome here. Renato, maybe you could go first. I mean, sure, certainly, I mean, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's a new procedure, right? But uh, uh, so I think we have, I mean, we, we already have principles there. Um, so first of all, proportionality, of course, because uh, it, it, this is going to become more important because the uh, potentially, uh, uh, if competition authorities are embarking upon more kind of uh, intensive investigations, then uh, uh, into pricing and pricing patterns and the workings and functioning of algorithms, I think that is go going to be uh, uh, quite quite important. I mean, the other one, which is controversial, I think, and I I'm, I'm not sure 
whether it goes a little bit against what um, uh, Henry and I I Isabella are arguing. I mean, is, is there a right to a, a, a human uh, a, a human being making decisions about uh, our business, our life? I mean, this is a problem that arises, of course, in competition law, but arises in all sorts of other of other areas of law is, is is there such a right or you know can can a um a, 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 a firm or can, can a company insist on a human decision maker and if we delegate uh, procedural decisions decisions about uh, um uh, maybe plausibility i mean you know which is which is an element of decision making, as, I, as Maria Teresa was saying. So, you know, is entry plausible? If this effect on the market plausible? I mean, a case can turn uh, on these issues. Um, can we delegate it under the current law uh, to um, uh, to a uh, to AI? And 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 of course, you know, because AI was was not there when our administrative law systems emerged. Uh, there is obviously no express rule against delegating these things with uh, to AI simply because I mean, certainly speaking about it, it, it English and also possibly Italian um, administrative law. I mean, there is not. No, I don't think there is there is any such rule. But I mean, there are certainly rules about uh, the right to judicially reviewed decisions, including procedural decisions, for example, for lack of reasoning. And if we give these procedural decisions and other substantive decisions uh, to AI, I mean, does AI provide reasoning? Generally not, right? And what, what, what type of AI uh, do we use? I mean, it, it, it can even be a kind of uh, self-learning algorithm, which is a completely black box. It says yes or not. So do we have to think about systems whereby, I don't know, for example, um, uh, a little bit like the set, like I'm trying to be imaginative, as Alexandra said, you know, can, can we um, can we uh, uh, then think about a system where companies can choose whether to go down the AI route or they, uh, but they can assert a right to human decision making if they want to? Um, I don't know, but I, I think this is not just in competition law, but more broadly, this is going to be, uh, and certainly there are areas of the law where the issue is much more serious, like criminal law, etc., um, yeah, family law and so on. But I mean, it, it's quite fundamental to me. Maggie, I saw you um, doing a gesture of approval uh, during Renato's um, contribution. So could you please react uh, to his uh... Uh, to his uh, contribution and uh, also answer the question, what is um, what is the new procedural right that should emerge with the development of the AI? Well, um, I try, I agree with Renato, and uh, I try to think as if there were a firm under scrutiny. If somebody took a decision against me by using an algorithm, I would I, I would like to understand how the algorithm play and how the judge or the administrative authority use it. So the role that the algorithm play in giving me that uh, result. So uh, how would you call that right? Right of transparency, right of uh, unboxing the algorithm, right to to understand the reasoning of the court, of the authority, and um, to be um, to be subject to a fair judgment. Now, because in my understanding, and probably I'm a boomer, so I'm not the right person to be in question. For, but in my understanding, these are tools that should empower um, us to be more powerful in analyzing reality, in giving uh, fairness, not tools whereby we should delegate uh, our responsibilities to computers or something else. So th that's my understanding of how we should use them in order to make our job the best, the better um, possible, not uh, in order to make it uh, more complex for uh, uh, companies uh, that want to, to exercise the right of defend 
or for the consumers. And they want to understand how authorities spend their money uh, to protect the functioning of the market. I don't know whether I was clear, but the idea is these are tools. I, I am not a great supporter of the idea that they should take the place of human beings. I see. Um, I think Renata also mentioned at some point that uh, maybe competition authorities should be equipped with uh, new competences. And uh, the, the question about procedural right uh, has the other side. So right now, the question is, uh, what kind of competences should uh, competition authorities uh, get with the development of uh, AI? What, what do you think about that? Renata, do you have anything uh, that you could think of? You know, I mean, it just very briefly, I mean, actually picking up on what, 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 what some Herwig was saying before, I mean, certainly I think that um, uh, uh, because of the use of AI by firms, by companies, um, uh, competition authorities should be given not that much more competencies, I'm not sure, but maybe more powers or different powers, because I mean, it, it would probably be also wrong to say more powers. I mean, competition authorities have now adequate powers to ask for information, et cetera, et cetera, in, let's say, the traditional economy. And, and to a certain extent, these powers can be interpreted uh, to suit the, 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 this new digital economy as well. For example, the, 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 the European Commission actually carried out uh, what we would call an empirical audit of the Google algorithm in the Google shopping case. So the input data into the algorithm to see whether actually it really did manipulate the, the outcomes or not. Um, so, uh, but, 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 but I do think that uh, first of all, as Hendrik was saying, um, uh, because of the difficulties in understanding these markets, um, uh, probably more fact finding uh, powers and maybe reporting powers in high risk uh, areas. I and mean, we have seen, for example, the AI Act. I mean, there, there was recently a, a political agreement as I understand it in the European Union on it. I mean, the, 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 the AI Act, uh, if ever adopted and implemented, we expect it will be, uh, does categorize activities in high risk uh, and, and, and others. So, for example, shall we think about also in the competition area, in the competition sphere, about high risk activities uh, and kind of reporting obligations, or quite sim quite simply, uh, powers uh, to be exercised by the competition authorities. Again, we have the tools, market studies, market inquiries. So, regardless of suspicions of uh, uh, of infringement, but uh, just in order to better understand markets powers to carry out audits, empirical audits, technical audits of algorithms. Um, are they already under the existing powers? Maybe, maybe not. Should it be clearer? Should we be clearer? On the one hand, in giving competition authorities uh, these powers, and on the other hand, clearer about the procedural safeguards that also apply, because these powers are not quite exactly the same is the ones that we know about. So one of the Thank aspects... You. I um, wanted to ask you, Hermic, yes. for your reaction, so please go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, I think Renato is, is absolutely right, but, you know, Isabella in my paper was about analyzing what's going on in the, in the area of computational antitrust and looking at whether we're not actually perfectly well equipped with traditional tools from public law uh, and, and more specifically competition law and I think we are actually very well equipped. Um, they just have to be properly applied in the context of, of uh, computational antitrust um, and the increase of data amounts we simply have. And in that context, one of the maybe newer principles or obligations one should impose on market participants is a certain amount of data retention, something you have uh, for other areas of the law, you know, whether it's telephone companies or banks and so on, um, so that if there is an investigation at a later stage, um, data doesn't have to be reconstructed about some market somewhere, which is virtually impossible, but the companies under investigation will have to show their um, 
data for a certain period of time um, as to how they reacted to certain markets. And then it can be reconstructed, possibly also with, with AI systems, which have maybe fed, been fed with machine data, of how other markets might have reacted. And that might be giving indications as to problems um, which have occurred in the context of uh, uh, whichever specific area, goods or services market one is on. Um, but this data retention obligation doesn't exist, but that is one of the elements we had been talking to, about right at the beginning of the, the session of how to actually get the data to feed the uh, AI systems or the, 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 the automated decision-making systems uh, in this context. Just one other remark on the data, it's interesting actually to see that now generative AI systems are becoming much more powerful and will develop much faster. There, the black box question is not even an issue anymore because um, they are, they are, these generative AI models are trained to large part on just general data. And knowing what training data went in or how they work doesn't help us to see what individual decision these powerful tools are suggesting. There it, it again becomes ever more important as, as Maria Teresa was saying, transparency, transparency, transparency is, is then the, the tool for holding um, uh, antitrust uh, authorities to account. Yeah, thank you. I also your your contribution made me think about the the recent Facebook Ireland case where Facebook actually argued for privacy uh, arguments and um, uh, it was rejected uh, at first. But we'll see how the case continues. Uh, Isabella, would you like to uh, react very quickly uh, to what Hervik said, and then I will give back floor to Thibault. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that uh, in, in general, what is the possible uh, procedural right uh, and uh, uh, to conclude, uh, I, I was thinking actually to be more concrete uh, on uh, having uh, auditing officers uh, instead, because I think that uh, um, sooner or later, as you all said, the competition authorities are starting to equip themselves with uh, much more powerful tools. And even if uh, right now they are just uh, taking baby steps or taking uh, a little bit slowly, um, uh, you are big mention uh, generative AI that are uh, becoming much more uh, uh, spread out. Uh, I think that this is, will be the, the, the way to go to for computation antitrust, uh, for competition authorities. And this is why I think that the transparency should be guaranteed also with the use of experts, uh, both at the internal level of competition authorities by having, for example, auditing officers to review in general the AI process and uh, the, um, uh, the, the systems that have been used, but also that might be important to how this, uh, the outcome of AI systems are presented in court uh, to ensure effective judicial review. And also there, it might be necessary to have experts, uh, uh, to have uh, some uh, um, judges that are trained uh, to read uh, the, and interpret the outcome of an AI, not just from the side of the systems, but in general for uh, uh, ensure transparency and for ensure effective judicial review of uh, decisions uh, since uh, as you all know, uh, sooner or later, AI will be used uh, much more by competition authorities, and uh, it might be necessary to explain much more in deep the results of an AI in courts and for the defendants. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, our time is, is up, and uh, Thibault asked me to give him back, back the floor. Thank you so much uh, for this panel. Thank you so much for sharing your take on AI and antitrust. It was a terrific panel. I'm very happy. I was very happy to moderate it. Thank you, participants, for being with us today. And back to you, Thibault. Thank yes. you, Alexander. <laughs> um, Erwig, you mentioned what should be, I think, not could, but should be the name of a paper, Transparency, Transparency, Transparency. <laughs> Uh, that will make for a great title, maybe for even a book. Um, so the link to your paper is in the chat. If you're watching this video on YouTube, let's say in uh, 2040, uh, you can go to computationalantitrust.com. I'm sure the website is still running <clears throat> and access their paper. And by then, uh, Maria Teresa and Renato's paper will be also published. So to all of you, thank you very much. Uh, for all the participants in the chat, thank you for staying up so late if you are in Europe and or for uh, launching with us if you are in the United States. Uh, before I let you go, two very quick things. 
number one, uh, you can actually go to Codex website, and I will encourage that you do so to not only check computational antitrust, but also what computational law uh, may enable uh, in uh, other spheres. And what I wanted to say is that we are back tomorrow. The program uh, is uh, on the event page, uh, but to go through it very briefly, we have a keynote by uh, Glenvel and uh, Zoe Hittig on how to combine computational antitrust and uh, principles of democracy to come up with a new way to think about antitrust. Then we will hear about researchers that have used computational tools to actually produce some results that you may want to hear about. We have a computational carousel uh, to mirror the agency carousel that we had today, in which you will hear from two companies, not sponsors, but just great companies that we thought you should hear about, about indeed what you can do with the computational tools. And the very last panel will be uh, computational antitrust in practice, in which, which is a first for us, we've uh, combined competition agencies, practitioners, um, and academic and someone working for a company, namely Google, talking about what they use, which tools they use, the challenges they see. So uh, again, thank you so very much for staying up uh, so late and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, same time as today um, and take care of yourself. And if you can, someone else too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.